Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> good morning. Um, uh, welcome, everyone, and good morning. I'm Sarah Rosen Wartell. Have the great honor and privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute and getting to welcome you all today. And thank you for joining us as we explore the work of the Urban Institute's inaugural Nitoli Practitioner Fellow, Manmeet Kerr. Manmeet is the CEO and founder of City Health Works, uh, and we're going to hear a lot about this program in just a few moments. Um, I also want to welcome those of you who are in our webcast audience. Um, we uh, hope you will join in the conversation today. If you want to ask questions of any of our panels, I encourage you to send them to events at urban.org at any time during the program, and we'll try to filter them up to moderators as time allows. Um, and I want to encourage everyone to share your thoughts and ideas. Try to avoid uh, uh, the impulse to check your email, but um, share your thoughts and ideas at the same time using social media. See uh, what we're talking about here today as well. Um, the Natoli Fellowship allows one practitioner each year to work with colleagues at the Urban Institute to generate actionable insights that can inform policy and build the capacity of the practitioner's home organization and others in the field to reduce inequality and support social mobility. Mamit was an ideal inaugural Natoli Fellow. During the fellowship, she's collaborated closely with urban experts on efforts to sharpen the national dialogue on chronic health care and the social determinants of health. And working with her, my colleagues and I at Urban have learned as well. And we've produced two qualitative reports on how health coaching models support chronically ill patients and medication management. Drawing from Menmeet's work and our learning together, today's convening will explore how to better care for patients with chronic illness and address their complex needs outside the doctor's office. Chronic conditions are on the rise. The health sector has not adequately responded to the changing needs of patients with these illnesses. These patients require complex care regimes, yet often leaves the doctor's office with little information on how to properly self-manage their conditions. The community health care model, the community health care worker model can fill this gap. Local residents are hired and positioned to motivate and teach patients to self-manage their conditions, navigate the healthcare system, and connect with social services. Meanwhile, the coaches gain valuable work experience and the dignity and self-esteem that comes from making a difference. For the Urban Institute, the partnership with Manmeet and the City Health Works has been very valuable. At Urban, we pursue our mission of building evidence to help scale what works, and we get practice from this partnership in collaborating up close, not just from afar, doing research that's immediately informing practice and those working on the ground. Today, almost half of all American adults, 117 million people, have one or more preventable chronic diseases, many of which are related to our larger societal struggle with poor eating patterns and a lack of physical activity. These diseases include cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. These challenges cut across all income groups, race, and ethnic backgrounds, and genders. And they reflect our social inattention for too long to making neighborhoods welcoming of physical activity and providing access to affordable, healthy food. Today, you're going to hear from patients, health coaches, payers, and providers, as well as a conversation with former Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary Sibelius, about the large-scale system implications of this work. But before we jump in, I want to take a moment to recognize the Rockefeller Foundation, which funds the Natoli Fellowship. The fellowship honors my former their former colleague and my good friend, Janice Nutelli, who we lost last year to a brutal condition frontotemporal dementia at the young age of 56. And just by coincidence, last night, I opened up my mail, and from her uh, university came this picture of her as a college student um, uh, celebrating her life. Um, and it was seemed sort of like great karma to me. Um, Janice was a proud daughter of working class queens a, queens, a true New Yorker, and a fierce social justice warrior. And in her career, she moves seamlessly between the worlds of research and ideas and service on the ground. And she would be excited to see the work we're discussing today. Um, so doing, seeing us talk today about the collaboration that is done in her honor is very moving personally to me and a great way to honor a special lady. The Natoli Fellowship would not have been possible without the leadership and support of the foundation's then president, Judith Roden, who helped us to launch this program. 
We're grateful to Rockefeller for this extraordinary opportunity to rethink how a research practitioner fellowship can inform and improve both organizations. And we're excited to announce soon, I'm not going to get ahead of anybody, right? But um, announce soon the next Natoli Fellow, another innovative NGO leader. But for now, I'm going to introduce uh, Sue Su, Chief Talent Officer of the Rockefeller Foundation, to come up and share a few words about our friend Janice. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much, Sarah. I know how much Janice treasured her relationship with you as well. And thank you to the extraordinary Urban Institute, whom we are always so inspired to partner with. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for to be here on behalf of the Rockefeller Foundation to recognize the amazing work of Monmi Kaur of City Health Works and to remember my dear former colleague, Janice Natoli, for whom this fellowship is named. Um, throughout her career, as many of you know so well, Janice was a brilliant, passionate advocate for low-wage workers. She embodied our mission to bring greater equity and opportunity to all people by leading our efforts to build better tools and options to help low-wage workers grow and manage savings in the United States. And perhaps it was how Janice did all of this that really set her apart from the rest. As I was thinking about what to say today, I reached out to some current and former colleagues um, as we all had the joy of working closely together with her. The words that sprung to their minds were bold, smart, dedicated, courageous, humble, vibrant, steadfast. Um, she was funny. She took the work seriously, but never took herself too seriously. She was authentic. She navigated the highest levels of government and philanthropy while remaining true to her identity as a proud girl from Queens, a balance that was one of the reasons she was so admired and respected. She was a mentor. A visit to the cafeteria wasn't complete until she had given grant memo advice to a junior associate next to the salad bar. And many colleagues have said they would not be where they are had Janice not believed in them and shown them how it's done. She humanized the work and knew that investing in other fellow humans was the best way to make a difference. As one colleague said, when I manage to give my best self to the world, I'm emulating Janice. She put everything on the line on behalf of those who are often overlooked and on the margins of society. Manmeet, for all of these reasons and so much more, Janice would have loved your work and she would have been so deeply honored to be associated with it. And she would also be excited to learn that the Rockefeller Foundation, building on her legacy and in a new focus over the next decade, is once again building a robust US jobs program. And the great thing is this program is being led by Abby Carlton, our managing director, who was actually an associate whom Janice hired eight years ago. Um, so she takes this legacy and responsibility incredibly seriously. Um, we see jobs and economic opportunity in the U.S. as a defining issue. Um, we don't need the markets to tell us that we're living at a great time of economic insecurity and inequality and when the vast majority of income gains go to just the top 1%. And like Janice, we just don't accept that. That's why over the next decade, our work will focus on improving economic mobility for Americans who have been excluded from the American dream. We will partner with workers, policy experts, and business leaders to ensure that more Americans have good jobs where they can build a hopeful future for themselves and for their families, something I know that everyone in this room deeply believes in is already doing such great work around. So in closing, Munmeet, it's people like you and like Janice um, who fight every day to make this American dream possible for so many. Um, it's a deep, deep honor to stand beside you. So thank you. So good morning. I'm Elaine Waxman. I'm a senior fellow here at the Urban Institute. And I've had the a very great pleasure of helping to coordinate the Natoli Fellowship in this inaugural year. Um, thank you for joining us if you're in the room or um, via webcast. Um, before we get started, we really wanted to center our conversation around the individuals who are living with chronic illness on a regular basis. Um, our healthcare system is not often designed from the person backwards. 
right? It's designed around a particular condition or it's designed um, around a payment mechanism or a provider setting. We want to start with the client themselves. And um, to bring that voice into the room, um, we had some great help uh, to create a short video that we can share with you now that shows you uh, some of the clients um, in conversation with their coaches and uh, give you a little flavor of the program that we're going to be talking about today. So you can also see this online later or now, and um, it'll take about five minutes. Me diagnosticaron con diabetes hace 13 años. El doctor me dijo que tengo que tratar de cuidarme, de hacer un régimen para poder bajar, controlar mi diabetes. Traté, pero yo sola no pude hacerlo. Entonces, hasta que por fin encontré este programa que me ha ayudado bastante. He trabajado con mi guía de salud por ocho meses. Ya yo aprendí cómo vivir con mi diabetes, tratando de comer lo que yo debo de comer y haciendo mi ejercicio regularmente. Eso me ayudó a salir a camino, tú sabes, a mejorar mi salud. City of Wars is really the bridge between the health system and the patient. We are in a broken system. The patient have 10 to 15 minutes with the doctors. Even though they are provided information, it's so quick that for many people, it's very difficult to digest and understand. That's why many people in the community that are dealing and struggling with chronic condition don't improve. Most people who go back to the hospital and have severe conditions are not because of their illness, but because of the mismanagement and not being able to manage it at home. So what we do is we go into their homes and we break down how they can manage and improve their illnesses. We provide education, we provide tools, we provide referrals for them to get the different services that they might be lacking. I've been working with the same doctor for like over 20 years, but I wasn't implementing what she was telling me. But with the health coach, I see myself implementing what needs to be done to be healthy. The doctor that I have now, he's very good. You know, he calls you. The health coach, seems like she has more time. She goes more into detail, things that the doctor don't have time to go through. She showed me how to eat a balanced diet, how to read different labels when you're taking food in. One of the most essential shortcomings of the hospital is not understanding what's going on at home. If you don't understand their personal needs, it's kind of hard to identify why they're not able to improve. We interact with the doctor very often. We try to at least once meet with the doctor and the patient. We try to be part of a team to work together to help the patient. Here at City Health Works, we use a method called motivational interviewing. So when we speak with our clients, it's extremely non-judgmental, and we let them lead the conversation. They're a little less intimidated, so they're a little bit more open to having conversations with us. And they're like, oh, okay, well, she's from where I'm from, so maybe she'll understand where I'm coming from, and she won't judge me. When I me reúno con mi coach, hablamos de mi dieta, de mi ejercicio, y además ella me ha ayudado mucho diciéndome, mira, tiene que beber tu medicamento a tu hora, tomar mucho líquido, que especialmente agua, y me la paso con ella como una amiga. The most important thing I've learned from the health coach is to ask questions about my health. Before, when I would go to my doctor, I would feel intimidated. Then I didn't really get to feel comfortable and talk in my needs, what's really bothered me, and ask for suggestions. But now, with the health coach, I have become empowered. Yo hacía mi aporme cuatro meses pa cinco meses, pero después del programa me di cuenta que no, que cada tres meses que yo tengo que ver mi doctor para que me controle mi diabetes. Y ya yo no fallo en eso. Cada tres meses tengo mi doctor y mis análisis y estoy pendiente a mi medicina. Y ya de ahí para acá me he sentido otra persona. My A1C is down now to 6.1 and my asthma is more under control. What I've learned from Marisol, I educate my children and my grandson. He's an asthmatic. Entonces yo a veces trato de decirle a algunas amigas mías, mira, trata de tomar mucha agua, trata de comer esto, de hacer esto para que tu diabetes se controle. Ella dice, yo no estoy comiendo nada frito y mi azúcar ha bajado más que a mí me ha bajado. This is a big revolution, as I call it, because we are not helping one person, one client. With that comes the family, the friends, the neighbors. Whatever they are learning, they are conveying that information to other people. She helped me to bring my A1C from a nine down to eight. But really, it helps me all over. Knowing someone that's concerned, it makes you feel better. I'm just glad that I have her to help me. 
I think they have a better sense of hope that although they've been suffering this illness for so many years, that it can actually be tackled if it's managed properly. Healthy communities produce a stronger nations. So we need to start with the community, with the people, providing the services that they need in order for them to be able to manage their health and their lives. So I know that was a little hard to hear in the beginning, so please I encourage you to go back and watch it online because they're really amazing um, individuals who speak very articulately about things that we should all be uh, thinking about. Um, before I introduce the panel, I'd actually like to acknowledge the fact that even though Monmi um, is the uh, Natoli Fellow and I have been coordinating the fellowship, in reality we're kind of a whole tribe that's been working together. and. Um, Several of those folks are in the room, and I would really like to acknowledge them. So some of the, in fact, some of the coaches that you saw um, in the video, uh, but I would like all of the City Health Works folks who are here to please stand and be acknowledged. And likewise, um, I would love it if all of my colleagues uh, at Urban who have had any contribution, including our event today, um, to please uh, stand and or uh, give a wave if you're busy. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll quickly introduce our panel, but then I would like for you to, um, to really hear uh, firsthand what they have to share. Um, on my far end here is my lovely colleague, uh, Lottie Aaron, who is a senior fellow in our Center on uh, Labor, Human Services, and Population. Lottie also co-directs our Social Determinants of Health Initiative. Um, one of the things that we often turn to Lottie for is insights from a very important report she helped uh, create a few years ago called uh, Shorter Lives, Poorer Health with the Institute of uh, Medicine that really reflects on uh, our larger health system and whether um, we're producing the results that we all wish and hope we had. Um, Jamila Hoy Rosas is the Chief Health Officer for City Health Works. Um, so she is the person who is helping to plan curriculum, do training, uh, work directly with the coaches, and help enact this vision. Um, and Lenny Rivera is um, coach extraordinaire, uh, so uh, you'll get to hear from her firsthand about uh, what her work looks like on a daily basis and the insights that she's bringing to us um, from clients that she works with. So Lottie, I'm going to start with you and um, with, a, with a big question, but one that I think uh, underlines everything we're discussing today, which is that Given the statistics that Sarah gave us this morning about the extent of chronic illness in the United States, do we have a system that's designed to address uh, what is in some ways an epidemic of chronic illness? Uh, in one word, no. <laughs> uh, and that's partly why we're here today and why programs like City Health Works are, are so needed. Um, Chronic illness really is the dominant set of illnesses and conditions that um, are driving he health care needs and health care expenditures in our country. Um, you know, Sarah mentioned a number of the ones that we all often think about, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, asthma, but they also include behavioral health. They include depression. They include substance use disorders. Um, and these are all conditions that are really uh, driving the, the engine of our healthcare system. Uh, it, they account for over 85% of our uh, annual healthcare expenditures, which are $2.7 trillion, I think, at this point, 18% of our GDP. Uh, and it's not just the prevalence of these conditions that are underlying those dollars, but it's how poorly we manage them. So. Uh, our system was built on really an acute care model. Acute illnesses are ones that have sudden onset, sh relatively short duration, 
and a pretty simple cause. Um, whereas chronic illnesses uh, on all three of those dimensions are very different. The, the drivers can precede the symptoms long before the illness matures. Um, it takes a lot of time and care and um, multiple teams to help manage them. Uh, and um, they require a, a much kind of broader set of drivers to address them, not just biomedical interventions, but biopsychosocial interventions in the community uh, with a real appreciation of the family context, the home context, and the community context. Um, and so, yeah, that's, this is why we need these programs. Ultimately, hopefully, we will evolve to models where we are preventing the growth of chronic illness mm -hmm. before we uh, are needing to kind of even manage the big tide that we're in the midst of right now. Ultimately, that needs to be the goal. So Jamila, the, I th one of the things that I've learned this year is really at the heart of the City Health Works model is this idea of building patient capacity. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of living with chronic illness is done far away from hospitals and doctor's offices and is about the ability to self-manage. Can you just tell us a little bit about um, what the coaching model looks like and maybe what's particularly distinctive about City Health Works? Yeah. So, um, think Thank you to everyone for being here today. I think uh, the video gives you a little bit of a glimpse of the work that we're doing. Um, and I'm always just kind of overwhelmed with pride uh, when I see it because it's really showing us from the patient perspective the impact of this sort of work. Um, but to just give you a sense of what our care model is, we have three main components and our coaches spend an equal amount of time working in these three domains. So we're um, focused on health coaching, on uh, patient navigation of the healthcare system and on care coordination. And so just to talk a little bit more about each of those, our health coaching program is really based on the best evidence available on how to self-manage chronic diseases. And our coaches are talking to people about very practical things, um, how to eat better, how to be more physically active, how to you know, take your medications on time, how to um, you know, deal with the emotional and mental burden of living every day with a chronic illness. And that's such an important part of the work um, in terms of the health coaching. And so um, with the patient navigation, we also wanna make sure that clients know how to access the right care at the right time. So uh, we often have, uh, we've had people who might go to the emergency room because they run out of a medication on the weekend. And so one of the things that the coaches will do is we will have this entire session talking about medications, why it's important to take your medications, what your medications are. And they're able to um, get people prepared for, for dealing with their medications, right? So calling in your refill on time, um, maybe getting yourself a three month supply so that you don't have to get refills as often, getting a home-based delivery service uh, to make it easier for patients. So all of these things help people to navigate the healthcare system a little bit better. The coaches will also prepare patients for their medical visits, accompany them. Um, as Maricelis mentioned in the video, that's an important component because we also wanna give patients the skills and the tools to be able to advocate for themselves when they're in the medical setting, to have a conversation with their doctor and to understand what's going on in their medical visit. The third component is the care coordination. And this goes back to what Lottie was discussing, you know, the importance of um, being able to identify the psychosocial, emotional, um, social determinants of health that are going on with people and making sure that those things, which may be core to the reasons that people cannot um, manage their illnesses on their own, that those things are identified and that those things are successfully addressed. Um, you know, one of the uh, things I was thinking about is that, you know, we often work with patients who are really afraid. They're afraid of interacting with the medical system. They have a lot of fear around, if I do these things, what will I, what will I learn about myself and what will I learn about this illness? And um, I think about the example of like using a glucometer, right, to check your, your blood sugar. You know, so you have to you know, prick your skin, you have to take the blood, it has to go on uh, a medical device. And there's so many things about that that are scary for people. 
And so someone might come to the program and be completely afraid to just check their medical, um, check their blood sugar. But they work with the coach, and so the coach talks to them about, you know, why, why are you doing this? How do you do this? And then what do you do with this information once you have it? So if your blood sugars are high, your coach has talked to you about how to lower those blood sugars. And if your blood sugars are too low, your coach has talked to you about what can you do to normalize those things. And so by having that opportunity to gain that knowledge, people are able to overcome their fear. They're able to better manage their health. They're feeling more empowered and more capable of self-managing. And that's a big part of the work that the coaches are doing. Great. And if I could just follow up, um, I know you've referenced diabetes. Mm -hmm. We saw that in the video. Yeah. But what are some of the other conditions that coaches are typically working with clients? Right. So um, currently, we work with diabetes, with asthma, hypertension. We have a new pilot where we're working with um, patients who are diagnosed with uh, congestive heart failure and working with them in the hospital and transitioning them home. Um, so all of these uh, illnesses have a have a uh, component that's similar, right, in that self-care is so important and the coaches are working with them around the self-care strategies that will help them better manage each of those illnesses. And if they have multiple illnesses, looking at the whole person. So what is it that you need to do to address all of these illnesses and, um, and better self-manage and, and take control of your health? And in fact, in some of the clients that I've met and spoken with, most of them are dealing with multiple yes. conditions, right? So adding to the complexity. Very common. Most of our uh, patients do have multiple medical conditions. They're on uh, seven or more medications. They're very likely to be experiencing some sort of depression or social isolation. So these are, um, these are really important factors. That, and it is part of our target population. We do really well with people who are struggling um, the most and who have not been able to be helped by the medical system as it currently stands. Great. So Lenny, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, why it's important that coaches like yourself actually come from the neighborhoods mm -hmm. that patients are um, um, being drawn from into this program. So why does that make a difference that you're um, familiar with the community um, and with the culture? Hi, everybody. Uh, what is important? Well, it is important because I am from the community. I have lived there for 22 years. Many of the people that live around sometimes might not recognize me by my name, but will recognize me by my face. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, some people will come to me and say, um, I remember when you used to take your child to guitar class. Mm -hmm. So they're not making the connection, but I think it has the warm trust. Uh, they feel like it is something that they can talk to, and I'm the person. For example, for them, explaining to the doctor what they're going through, for many of them, is very hard. They don't speak the language. Doctors don't, speak, don't, don't understand the culture. Me, I, I speak their language. I understand the culture. Mm -hmm. Coming to terms, like when I came to this country, I didn't speak English. I spoke Spanish only, and it was terrifying. I was so nervous every time I had to step in the elevator. I thought someone would say something to me, I won't know how to answer. Mm -hmm. I, my son needed services, he needed to go to the doctor's office. I didn't know how to explain to the doctor what my son was going through. And by me learning, my husband will help me a little bit, he was in a school back then, and I will say, how do I say ear? How do you, I say mouth? How do I say pain? Mm -hmm. And hoping that the doctor will connect the dots and find out what my son had. But it is terrifying, so I understand from them when they say, when I go to the doctor's office and the doctor doesn't speak my language, I don't know what to say. I feel hopeless. I don't know what to do. I come out from that office not understanding what I need to do and having someone like you, it helps me to better understand you, speak to me, you write it down for me, you mark my medication battles that way I can understand. So for that, I think I'm the person to work with these people. And um, talk a little bit more about why it's so important to build trust with patients in before they can hear some of the more technical information that Jamila described that you know people need to process and learn how to work with. Well, building trust is very important because from building trust, that's what is going to come the improvement, the improvement of this client. They're going to open the door to me or they're going to close the door in my face. <laughs> so um, I think and that, that happens sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it never happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> they, they might see me tiny and say, oh, poor girl, so let's just open the door for her. <laughs> so it is intimidating. 
in some point, when I do the first contact, it's a phone call. When I mention my name, my name is Lenny. Some people might think, oh, this is a guy. <laughs> and some people have said to me, oh, I thought you were a man. <laughs> and then I say, well, last time I checked, I was still a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so it is when they get to know me, when we make the first contact, I try to make them feel comfortable. It's not just telling them, open the door for me because I'm going to tell you what you need to eat. No, it is open the door to me because I want to help you. Hold my hand and I will guide you because I understand what you're going through. I have family members that have gone through this. And so I can help you. That trust is going to be the part, the key part for them to make an improvement. And by that being said, I sometimes like to joke a little bit with them, make the environment a little bit warm. It's not just about telling them you need to improve their health. No, you're going to work st one step by step, but you're going to get your goal, and I'm going to be here, standing here next to you, and we're going to do it in a fun way. Uh, I'm going to give an example of one client that I have, and this client is a 77-year-old. He has two daughters. He is from Mexico. Of course, Mexican food is delicious, so <laughs> all his meals consist of a lot of starches. Um, the daughters are very involved with this client, but by the first time he saw me, he said, like, um, I'm, I came over here because my daughters are pushing me to come over mm -hmm. here, but I really don't want, don't want to do this. I want to eat what I like. Mm -hmm. So we sat, I started joking a little bit with him. I said, okay, this is just to discuss that you're not going to eat for tacos. Now you're going to eat two and you're going to give me two. <laughs> <laughs> I think he started to warm up a little bit. And since he didn't want to inject insulin, I found out that this was the key for me to introduce the food in an easy way and always remind him, what you don't want to do is inject insulin, correct? So we can start making changes. So he started making all these changes. It wasn't easy. All the time he will complain. He's, he will say to me, because of you, my daughters now are giving me like this amount of rice. I like to eat like this. <laughs> <laughs> and the other part was like, every time I look to the right, it's grass. If I look to the left, it's grass. They feeding me like a cow. They feeding me <laughs> like a horse. So I'll say, don't complain. That's what my father said at the same time. The same way my father complained all the time because my father also has diabetes. But he started making all these changes. He was feeling comfortable because it's something that he was doing at his pace. I said, you don't have to make anything major. Do it little by little. So he started doing all these changes, and he started seeing the changes. At the end, he started going to the gym. His medication, he's only on one medication now. He doesn't inject insulin, and he got a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I think the major thing for him was having that girlfriend and that all the improvements he did were worth it. He has a woman and he has muscles now. <laughs> I can't top that. No, <laughs> none of us can. <laughs> um, Jamila, so one of the things that I've also really learned from uh, the work this year is that in addition to the individual client-coach relationship, there's some really important um, bridging roles that coaches and City Health Works play back to clinics and creating partnerships with clinics and having um, providers understand better what a non-compliant patient is going through, right? That we may think non-compliance is a choice when it may be much more complicated than that. Can you talk a little bit about um, sort of how the curriculum and the clinic partnerships sort of make a difference here? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, it's very hard to follow Lenny. I don't have, uh, <laughs> I don't have the funny lines. Um, but I think, you know, one of the key things is uh, choosing the right people. Mm -hmm. And so as you can see with um, a coach like Lenny and, and our other coaches, um, part of our work and kind of um, workforce development is, is choosing the right people. And so when you choose the right people um, who uh, demonstrate active listening skills, who are empathetic, who have experience with doing this kind of caring, compassionate work, then it's really easy to train. It's really easy to um, teach them to uh, model uh, for their clients the sort of behaviors that will help them improve in their health. And so um, we do that. We have a very, uh, very rigorous interview process with our coaches. We have a very um, uh, 
you know, evidence-based, flexible curriculum that they're able to use with their clients. And uh, that curriculum is really tailored to the needs of the patient. And so if you have someone who is, um, wants to lose weight, you, know, you might talk a lot about portion size and um, reducing the amounts of tacos or tortillas that they may be having. Um, if you have someone who's socially isolated and depressed, then you might be talking to them about building up their support system and making sure that they are um, engaging in activities that will bring them joy. And so this is an important part of our work that, we, um, that we're doing. And then we're able to partner with our, um, with our clinicians, with our clinical partners, and talk to them about this work. We send um, progress updates so that they know how clients are doing. We send them information about the goals that, um, that their patients have set. So that we're all on the same page, so we're all aligned, we're all working towards the same goals with these, um, with these patients. And how powerful is it, you know, when someone goes to their medical appointment with their health coach and, um, you know, they can demonstrate these improvements in their A1C or in their blood pressure. Um, and we often, you know, we have uh, access to a read-only version of the medical record and we see, you know, where the doctors write in the notes, um, you know, client came with their health coach, um, they're doing much better, they're eating less portions, their A1C has gone down. And so we see all of these shout outs in the medical record where um, clinician partners really do appreciate and value the work that the coaches are doing and that how important this partnership is, this bi-directional communication. We're talking to them, they're talking to us, and we're all aligned and working together to make sure that these patients um, have the best outcomes possible. That's great. So can you tell us quickly, Lenny, how you work with clients in terms of frequency? So in the beginning, I know it's more intensive. Can you talk a little bit about how over the course of a year you're working with a client? Sure. Um, so at the beginning of the sessions, there are like two to three months that are intensive coaching. And we accompany the client to the doctor's visit, uh, any social services needs that they have, we go with them. Uh, let's say we have many clients that are illiterate finding the ways to see how we can work with them, reminding them about the medication. In my case, I will mark like little dots in different colors. Mm -hmm. Like I will put, for example, some clients have like three medication for high blood pressure. They don't understand, they take everything, but sometimes they will miss one. But if I had noticed that if I put like a little mark and red mark it, and I will explain to him all this that you see with the same color, the same that, these are for high blood pressure and then he has two, let's say that they had two medication for diabetes, mm -hmm. and then I would put a, a blue dot and say, you follow these two dots, and this, these are going to be diabetes. So that keeps in control, seeing that the client at least will remember they have a sharp mind. When they don't know how to read, they have a sharp mind. And so you, can, you come to learn that they memorize everything. Um, so those first sessions are very intensive in terms of checking with the client that they are they understand how to take the medication, that they are going to doctor's visit, that they are following the eating habits. And then it would be nine months of just uh, uh, maintenance sessions. And these maintenance sessions, we will do kind of the same thing, but it will be more like reinforcement of the sessions we did before, um, just to see if the client is still following a goal. They, some of them might have a hard time still making changes, minimizing starches. So we will review the session. Or if they are not, they forgetting to inject <coughs> insulin, go back to the medications and remind the client how, to, how important it is to inject insulin mm -hmm. and to continue doing it. So the client stay with us for a period of a year. And at some point after three months, we start seeing a little changes. And if we don't see that, all these maintenance sessions are just reinforcement. And what drew you to coaching in the first place? And do you think of this as um, a career for you at this point? Or do you see this as a stepping stone in, in other uh, goals you want to achieve? What drew me? As a child, my mother in Honduras is a nurse. So what drew me to be a health coach is that I have a passion for helping people. And my mom say, it's not usually about what you do, it's how you do it. Do it with all your heart and people might like that. It doesn't matter, people can be nice, people can be bad, but if you do something good, you will feel good. So I did it because I will see my mom going around the community. I grew up in a poor community and people didn't have money to pay for an, to pay for an injection. Um, sometimes they needed IV, my mother need, knew how to do it, or they needed stitches removed. 
-hmm. and I would like to accompany my mom to see everything. Sometimes I like it because there are criers over there, and then people cry when they get an injection. So that was the fun part to go back. And the other hand was like nice seeing the to what my mother will do and how what the passion she has. Sometimes we didn't have money, but she wouldn't say, "Oh no, if I give you an injection, you need to pay me." No, you say my mom will say if. Uh, you do something good, maybe in later on something good will come out of that. And I see that because sometimes we, we, need, we needed to go to church. The place where we live was a little dangerous. And by the, one day, someone tried to rob the home, and some neighbors came and said, we scared the person, so we were taking care of your home. And then mommy said, you see, that's, the wha that's why mm -hmm. we do something good, because we never know who can be watching after you. So I think I like the help they help you a lot, but also seeing so, so many people in need makes me feel like I have a skill, why not to share with them? It's something that came to me and probably was done not in an easy way because it took me a lot of, a lot of time to understand English, but I'm here. And by me accompanying my client to the doctor and translating for them, it gives me a warm feeling while I see a happy face, knowing that they got out from that office, understanding everything they needed to do. And it is a stepping stone for me as well. I like um, nutrition, so I want to become a nutritionist. Mm. And I feel like <laughs> doing something like this is something that I can still, if I become a nutritionist, I still can be helping the community and not just the community, whoever is in need. Eating habits are very important to improve our health. Great. I'm going to take uh, some questions here shortly, but um, Lottie, I want to uh, come back to you one more time and say, in the course of this year, um, say a little bit about what we've been working on and maybe something surprising that you've learned um, from this uh, collaboration. It's, it's been a tremendous partnership, and um, I just think, you know, we're researchers here at Urban. We're very um, policy and practice oriented researchers, but we're still researchers. Um, and being able to work alongside um, a group like City Health Works and really see up close the hard work that it takes to develop a program like this, both the workforce component and the caring component, and to understand what's so valuable when you're really in a community doing this work. It does, um, it does change, at least in my experience, how researchers think about this, what questions we ask, what data we might collect, how we analyze the data. Um, you know, so much of what we've heard today, you know, the word humanize came up. This is about, um, you know, high-touch, high low-tech care. This is about patient care that is patient and caring. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Unlike so much of the patient care that gets delivered in our healthcare system, and that's not to slam that system fully. I think there are a lot of providers in that system who were drawn to medicine and uh, healthcare and want to be having the luxury of this time and attention and often don't and which is why you said so many of the providers actually really value this partnership because it really helps the care that they're delivering have the impact that they know it, it can and should. But from the researcher side, I, I just think it's been tremendous just to really uh, rethink kind of how we're presenting the data, how we're pushing it. Um, if it doesn't, if the results or the impacts aren't always as strong or as statistically significant as we might like to be able to show the world, <laughs> that there may be other reasons for that, and it doesn't mean we back off. It means maybe we um, wait to see as the model grows, as it improves, uh, and you know, and not just this model, but other efforts like that that you know we strongly sense are really making a difference and compensating for you know, inadequacies in some of the mainstream programs and systems that we often study, so. Well said. All right, um, I hope this has given you a taste of um, both the kind of work that they're doing and also um, how delightful it's been to be in partnership with them. Um, so we have a couple of roving mics. We also can take questions online, um, so you can submit those and uh, we will also, um, so here in the black and white, yeah. 
Okay, thank you so much. Ooh. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carol Regan. I'm with an organization called Community Catalyst, and we do a lot of work around the country on behalf of low-income um, uh, communities, and we'll do a lot of our partners work with community health workers. So thank you for sharing your model. I have sort of a quick two-part question. One is, you mentioned the social determinants of health, and you go to home visits. So I imagine you're also a bridge to places where you need to do home modifications or you need to figure out transportation for folks or all that. So I wondered if you could talk about your relationship with social service organizations. And then secondly, um, how much are health plans in New York or other providers bringing your, you into their payment models so that you're being built into the reimbursement rate so that you're paid for because they realize the, the importance and savings? Thank you. So it will be a great transition to our next panel where we will actually have some <laughs> of those um, providers and plans. But, but yeah, Jamila, you want to talk just a little bit about um, both of those things, interacting with uh, social services and other needs and um, the extent to which this is being welcomed by providers. Yeah. Um, so those are great questions. Thank you so much. I think um, we, we have a very strong relationship with uh, neighborhood partners who are working in some of these areas. Many of our clients, as you, as you mentioned, um, they are dealing with social determinants of health that are above and beyond, you know, just uh, their, their medical condition. And so those things need to be addressed because they are a priority. Um, you know, one such partner um, I'm thinking of is LSA. They are, they've been working with us in a, um, an asthma program for elderly adults. And uh, part of that was the coaches going into the home, doing a thorough home assessment, and identifying triggers in the home that may be making it uh, more likely that someone's not able to manage their asthma. So if there's a mold condition, if there's a clutter problem or a vermin uh, issue, and they would come in and help to modify the home um, and make sure that those things were addressed so that those kind of structural issues were addressed. And now we can really talk about, are, are you taking medication? Do you know how to use your inhaler? Do you have a spacer? Um, so that, you know, that's an example of one, one such partnership we have. Um, we're also partnering uh, now with God's Help We Deliver. They are helping us to make sure um, we can address food insecurity with our patients who are struggling with chronic illnesses. You know, you cannot take care of yourself and focus on medications and all of these other things if you're hungry. And so we want to make sure that those things are, are properly addressed. Uh, in terms of your second question, whether or not you know payment models have been open to us and, and are providing payment, we um, have a contract right now with uh, Mount Sinai Health Systems and working through their district program to pay for the congestive heart failure program that I mentioned earlier, where the coaches meet with the patients at the bedside before they're discharged home, kind of establish that rapport, establish that relationship, and then transition with them out into the community and helping them to um, do the things that they need to do in order to manage their uh, CHF and not come back to the hospital. Um, and so we, we've definitely seen some pickup there, but uh, um, as Elaine mentioned, the second panel is going to talk a lot more about uh, these healthcare models and, and, and programs that have been open to us, and they really have been excited because they know we're bringing a lot of value in terms of uh, increased patient satisfaction, um, decreased uh, total cost of care, and people just doing better. They're happier. There's a lot more joy in their lives when you know you can take care of yourself and you're feeling better. Great. Thanks. Um, here in the scarf. Hello, um, my name is Deanna Attenson. I'm from PCORI, um, and we fund, um, I think it's 56 studies that are utilizing community health workers. And prior to PCORI, I worked as a community health worker. So my question is, um, as a community health worker, um, we addressed a lot of the social determinants of health, and um, like you said, food insecurity, and all these different things, but it was really difficult for us to measure the effectiveness of what we were doing, because we were doing all of these, um, we were helping with all these different things and social services and acting as a bridge, which we knew worked because we see the testimonies of our patients. Um, but sometimes it's not always reflected in the final health outcome that we're looking for um, as immediate as we would like. So my question is how um, are you internally um, kind of measuring your effectiveness of how you're doing? Sure. Uh, part of that, I think, is the patient care yeah. that Lottie alerted to, right? This willingness to, to wait for some results. But 
Um, Jamila, do you want to talk a little bit about how you're thinking about that? So we do have a number of evaluations that have been going on, and you're right, it's so hard to kind of measure, you know, people's uh, increased self-efficacy, their self-capacity, their resilience, their uh, increased joy and dignity. Um, but we are, you know, kind of looking at some subjective markers of those things. We're looking at health outcomes, how things are improving over time, whether or not people are going um, to the hospital less often, at their, um, uh, you know, their quality of life, whether or not they understand their medications. So all of these things are, have been embedded in our evaluation programs from the very beginning. And um, you know, the way we designed this care model, we we're always trying to make sure we could demonstrate the effectiveness of the program. Um, outcomes are so important. And as you mentioned, you, know, you, you can say all day that things are going well, but if you can't prove it, if you don't have the evidence, then it's gonna be hard to get people to pay for and respect these programs. And so we really built that into the core of how we do our work. Um, we're, we're evaluating things, we have assessments, um, we're looking at people's changes over time, and um, you know we have a number of evaluations that are going on right now, and we're hoping to have some of that data out uh, later this year. And I'll just mention that two products that have come out of this fellowship, one is a brief that's available today um, on the client's perspectives on health coaching, and another one coming up soon is on medication management and the extent to which mm -hmm. Um, coaches uh, are able to support that. So um, it, I think it, it speaks to the need to have a, a well-rounded set of indicators as well as those individual insights. Uh, yes, here. Uh, thanks, it's a joy to be here. Um, Prabhjot Singh I'm from the Arnhold Institute for Global Health at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Um, question for you is about limits of either when you find that you're not making enough progress with a client, is there a point where you, s you say, this isn't working? Um, so how do you know when to potentially stop or take a break? And then limits of eligibility. If you're working with uh, clients that e either have significant mental health challenges or substance abuse disorders, is that part of what you do as a coach? Or is that something where you have to then bring in more support? So, Lenny, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, there are times that the client does not do, doesn't, we don't see any improvement. And at that point, we talk to Yamila and David about probably um, terminating the services. It might be something else um, that is going on with the client. At the moment, we just recognize probably the client is not processing the information or is not willing to make any changes. And so it is good always to come to Yamila and David when they approve and say, okay, I see there is no case. So yeah, don't, don't see the client anymore. Um, the other thing is that that is not always the case. Sometimes even though the clients are resilient to make any changes, at least they will do one thing. Maybe they were not injecting insul insulin and now they started injecting insulin. Sometimes it might be that they were not taking the medication the way the doctor prescribed. Some people are scared to take medication. Some of them don't want to inject insulin because they think that they're going to die if they inject insulin. So by us explaining again, and it might take a little while, but the client starts making changes. So not all is lost, not all cases are lost. Mm -hmm. And um, the other part was, I'm sorry. If, uh, are, do you run into situations where maybe clients have significant mental illness or um, cognitive impairment or things that you feel like you're, you're gonna need extra help with? And it sounds like one of the things you do is turn to the clinical supervisory team, but. Yes, um, and this, at this point, yeah, there are some clients that have men mental illnesses and it might not work. I have one case where my client had uh, the, um, schizophrenia and we started well. She insisted that she was taking the medication, but at some period of time, uh, she just didn't want to open the door to me because she thought mm -hmm. that I died during the holidays mm -hmm. and that I just, I was hunting her. So that was like a little intimidating because I didn't know how she was going to act at the moment that she will see me. And so I talked to Yamila and David and they say, let's terminate the services. And <coughs> mental health, I have a um, mentally ill client. It's not, it do, it's not very obvious, but you can see it sometimes because in the terms that he's been taking medication, sometimes he forget, he's overdosing. 
Um, I've been working little by little. This is the client that I've been marking bottles and re uh, reminding him how to take the medication, talking to the doctor that maybe three pills might be too much, maybe if it, the same pill, but it will be one. Uh, it will help, and the client started with an AC, A1C level of nine, and it went down to 6.5. Mm -hmm. So it is sometimes a For barrier, but you don't know what that <laughs> means. That's very good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Um, so it is constantly checking in with the client, regardless what mental health problems they have. If we see that is something that we cannot deal with, always talk to our supervisor. So I think again, speaking to the fact that the, uh, a coach is part of a, a larger team, yes. and that communication um, across is really important. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I'll take you in the middle there and um, I encourage you to stick around. We will um, expand our view throughout the morning, talking to the providers, talking to payers, talking to Secretary Sebelius, and then um, if you are able to stay after the program, you'll have a chance to chat directly with the coaches and ask them some more questions. So Thank you, Philip Shilia, the Department of Health and Human Services, HRSA. So there's a lot of knowledge that the coach need to master in order to understand disease and, and to transmit the right message to, to their clients. Uh, you know, um, congestive heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, and all the psychosocial determinants of health. So if you can give us briefly how practically those coaches are trained, how long is the training, who is delivering the training, how do you mentor them the first few weeks, how you ensure over time uh, consistency, is there some oversight, and maybe refresh your training just to, to better understand how we know they try to do the best, but to be sure that they are doing the right thing. Yeah, Absolutely. excellent question. Jamila yeah. can talk about yes. that. Yes, thank you. I didn't get a chance to talk about that <laughs> earlier. Um, and I was kicking myself to not have that opportunity. So, uh, yeah, so your question is about how are the coaches trained? What does that look like? How do we make sure that they are confident and comfortable when they go out? and working in the field. And so um, we have an on-the-job training process. Uh, they are trained for six to eight weeks um, by their clinical supervisors. And we really focus on, um, you know, we feel that we are the coach of the coaches, right? So we are um, role modeling for them the ways in which we want them to interact with their clients. And throughout that process, we're really focusing on making sure a good competence over the um, material and not just the material, but the way in which to interact with the client. So what does that feel like to be doing motivational interviewing? What does it mean to have a non-judgmental stance? What is it, how does, that, how does that interaction occur in a natural way so that um, clients really feel comfortable um, and they feel that you know what you're talking about, but they're also on the same level, right? So they have this trusted relationship, um, a pure sort of relationship where you know, the coach knows what they know and they're helping to teach that information. But the goal is, I want you to know what I know. I want you to be able to read a food label. I want you to be able to count your carbs. I want you to understand why you're taking your medication. So that's all just shared knowledge, and we want to make sure that we're all working in this together. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a very deliberate process. It's a very intentional training. Um, there's a lot of assessments over time to make sure that people feel confident. Um, and so the same way we want our clients to feel comfortable and confident competent in taking care of their, um, their illnesses. I want my coaches to feel comfortable and competent in being able to deliver this, um, these messages. And so we, we take a lot of time to make sure that that's happening well. And Jamila, we need to wrap up, but I, I was impressed that the coaches actually have the ability, I don't know if it's an app or whatever, but you, you, you like communicate yep. back and forth from the field, right? And yeah. you can actually look back and see the trail of communication as well. Right, so we have a very uh, a custom uh, technological system that we're using. Uh, the coaches are out in the field, they've got phones and tablets, and they can communicate directly with their health coach supervisor. So shout out to David, um, who's back in the office. And it's so important, you know, for the coaches to feel that they are not alone. They are not out in the field without someone who's a lifeline back to the office. So if there, um, something's going on, they don't feel comfortable. Um, they feel like it's you know, outside of their scope. They have a, a, 
a supervisor who is available to them at all times. They can tag uh, the supervisor within the software and they'll respond uh, quickly to whatever their need might be. So even though they're well trained, they're competent, they're, they're really skilled, they also are not alone. They're out in the field and they have backup in the office to help them with whatever situation they might encounter that might be you know, outside of their scope or something that they don't feel comfortable with. Great. Yeah. Well, thank, uh, thank you all and um, join me in thanking um, our panel. to our next panel to let you hear from the provider uh, side and also from Monmeet Core directly. Um, our moderator for this panel is Joanne Kennan, uh, who is the health editor at Politico Pro. And in addition um, to, to being a skilled journalist, she also has previously done a detailed in-depth look at City Health Works and so has spoken a lot with the coaches and, and with clients and I think brings that to this uh, conversation this morning. Thank you. I heard, um, I mostly edit, I don't really write that much. And I heard Mamid speak last June for what, like 30 seconds, 60 yeah. seconds at the initial opening session? And I said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go talk to her. I'm going I'm to write about her. And um, somehow or other, on a week that my team also exposed Tom Price and I had emergency dental surgery, I somehow managed to get to New York <laughs> and um, write a piece that was really, um, rewarding to me. Um, it, it's, uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the patients I, I met were the ones you saw in the video. Let's start with just a quick introduction. You have the detailed bios. I'm not going to do that. Um, Amit Kaur is the CEO and founder of City Health Works. Teresa Soriano, I think I'm pronouncing that right, um, is the vice president, senior vice president for care transitions and population health at Mount Sinai. Uh, St. Luke's works very closely in really innovative ways with um, the community health workers that probably a lot of other providers would balk at initially. And Alex Faderman is the Director of Research at the Division of General Internal Medicine, also at Mount Sinai. Um, so let's just start, Mamit, with how did you get into this? What happened? Sure. So uh, thank you again um, to the Urban Institute for this tremendous opportunity. I just want to acknowledge how, how incredibly rewarding it has been for our organization to learn with you and to have this opportunity to step back and think about what is the impact besides the data and look more qualitatively at the kind of insights of our, that our coaches and our clients could share and to write about that. So a huge, huge appreciation for this opportunity. Um, uh, so we, uh, I, I should first say I, I, my, I'm, I didn't start my career in healthcare and came into this from more of a workforce perspective and um, uh, I've always been very interested in informal types of jobs and was very excited about models that can, um, prof by, that can show better outcomes by professionalizing the workforce. And so um, I spent a few years abroad working with community health and workforce development initiatives in South Africa and India and became formally exposed to this community health worker concept uh, via the Millennium Villages Project, a 10-country rural economic development project um, in Africa and was really taken by the um, ability of these remote workforces in very, very um, uh, low, in, low income environments uh, to communicate with health systems and to reach people 
um, in very um, remote environments. And so when I came back to New York, uh, my husband was starting residency and I started getting curious about what happened in those short doctor's appointments and what happened when these patients go home. And we both started talking about how it kind of felt like a revolving door that many of the drivers of health um, are, the social drivers are in the neighborhood. But also with chronic illnesses, there's a lot of information. I mean, you asked this question about training. Um, there's a lot of expectation of these patients to understand pretty complex conditions. And so um, I started asking this question of, uh, and this is 2010, 2011, and the Affordable Care Act was being developed and signed. And so as the industry was starting to shift to value-based care, I started asking this question of, um, is there a role that a non-clinician can play? I knew that was certainly true from a health perspective, but could we create a business case for showing that this type of a workforce like Lenny, like Maricilis, who you were watching, um, can dramatically Im uh, improve health outcomes and cost savings uh, when well-trained, when well-supported, and when um, embedded in the neighborhood, but closely partnered with the, the, the delivery system in terms of the providers of care. Healthcare is full of great ideas that sound wonderful. I mean, in spite mm -hmm. of all the turmoil politically the last few years, there's also been a lot of innovation and, and a lot of trying new things. And a lot of things that sound great don't really work when you put them in the real world. You've been not just sending your workers out there, but tracking, doing data. Nothing is definitive yet, it's fairly new, but what do you know? What are you pretty confident of in terms of the early data that you're seeing? Sure, so I should first say we're currently based in Harlem in, East, um, uh, in New York, and um, we started with a focus on diabetes. We've since added asthma, hypertension, and we're most recently congestive heart failure. Um, we have the most data thus far for uh, pre-post outcomes for patients who had um, poorly controlled diabetes from a primary care clinic. Um, on average, the blood sugar reduction was 1.6 at a year, which is quite significant. Um, from a cost perspective, the same group of patients, on average, there was a $600 per member per month drop in spending at week 10, and a $900 per member per month drop in spending by month five. And at that time, we didn't even have our fancy app and technology. <laughs> they were using um, pretty rudimentary um, documentation tools. Um, I do want to also emphasize that the patient satisfaction is extremely high. We use a, a simple measure of that, which is, would you refer this to someone else? And um, our scores always averages around 90. Um, and then in terms of getting people to actually sit down and have a coaching session, uh, we also track how well we do in terms of getting people to meet with the coach and enroll and stay through the program and, there, and those, those rates are extremely high. But I will add that we certainly care about rigor and recognize in healthcare it's very important to show that with controls. And so we currently have three um, active trials that have controls that will show us how we're doing in relation to. Um, yeah. Alex, you have um, you're a researcher. Are you also a cl um, in clinical practice right now? You're yeah, I'm a so primary care physician. Right. So talk about some of the research you've been tracking, the pa patient population you've been looking at. I think is it mostly asthma? Yes. Okay. In terms and then of talk about just some of the people that, you know, these are hard patients. Um, you don't want to blame it on the patient, but they live hard lives and they have multiple diseases, as we've heard. And you, as a in primary care, you know, have to connect a lot of dots in a mm -hmm. ten-minute office visit. Right. So st start a little bit about what you know about the research, and then talk about how what you're seeing as you interact with the same patients that Mamid is working with. Um, well, the research has shown us, uh, you know, over the last couple of decades that there are so many different factors that go into uh, people's self-management behaviors when it comes to a chronic disease. Um, and we're hearing a lot about social determinants of health. And, and you know, healthcare systems have only really recently come to recognize the, the absolute importance of that. And so I, you know, I see it in clinical practice. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, the 10 minute office visit. Uh, and I see patients in the same community, basically, where City Health Works operates, um, very low income community. Uh, we have a very high proportion of patients on Medicaid. This is a population of patients that have multiple chronic diseases. They might be on 10 or 15 different medications. So in that 20 minutes of time that I have to spend with them, um, I need to check off 
a lot of boxes uh, for just simply making sure that they're getting quite their literally, medication. Right? <laughs> and, and quite literally, too, and that's gotten worse, unfortunately. Right. right. Um, uh, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but um, but it, so in that short period of time, a, as a clinician, I simply don't have the, the time to do all that work to unearth what's really behind <coughs> their uh, problems taking their medications on a regular basis or avoiding triggers for their asthma. Um, and, and so we, I see this all the time, my colleagues see this all the time. What, like asthma is partly an environmentally triggered, people, people have mm -hmm. um, things around them that sets them off. What can you find out by having a community health vis worker visit a home yeah that you did not know by just asking the questions, even if you thought you thought of all the questions. Yeah, so this is One really- One of the quotes in the story, it wasn't asthma, it was diabetes, was um, the, the community health worker can go to the home and look in the refrigerator. Yep. Um, that's sort of a CHF, sodium and diabetes question, mm -hmm. but what, does, what information can you get that you didn't have? So this is really one of the uh, several but really great features of working with an organization like City Health Works where um, you have somebody going into the home, they have eyes on the home, and th that is, there's so much tremendous value to a clinician. So let, uh, a quick example, um, I might see a patient, they don't come in with their medications, and um, I, it's not exactly clear which medications they're taking. Um, and so I'll say, oh, please next time come back with your medication. Of course, they don't come back with their medications next time, or maybe they'll come back with one or two bottles, or maybe they come back with, 15 bottles and there's triplicates of several of them. So it's really unclear what's going on. Having somebody who can go into the home and really see what the environment looks like. Where are they keeping their medications? Are the medications in a place where they're actually gonna remember to take them? Is there mold exposure? Um, is there secondhand smoke? Um, do they have carpets? You know, these are all important issues for people with uh, asthma, of course. Um, but, you know, for in speaking generally about chronic uh, illness self-management, these are all critically important features. And, and these, this is not a perspective that a, 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 the typical clinician is able to get. And when you first came into contact, I don't know how often or how long you've been working with them, how much did you, I mean, I know you're a fan now, but when, when someone came to you and said, your patients can get this, uh -huh. Did you say, this is what I've been waiting for? Or did you say, eh? <laughs> no, I, I cheered, uh, I jumped up and down. Uh, so uh, I uh, you know, had been working um, in uh, doing research around these types of drivers of uh, health outcomes um, and knew that uh, there's just a giant chasm between um, what happens uh, in the doctor's office and what happens in the real world of the patient. And, you know, without our eyes, you know, the clinician's eyes being able to see what goes on in the home, without being able to provide sort of the constant reinforcement that patients need to master chronic illness self-management. Um, it's, it's a broad set of skills. And, and for most patients, you, you can't get away with uh, you know, giving them a primer and a piece of paper or a reference to a website and expect them to really do it well. And especially when it's a population that's under a great deal of stress, financial stress, you know, maybe the, the, the built environment around them introduces a lot of stress. It's just, it's, uh, it's not an achievable, achievable uh, approach. And, and I think uh, what I recognize back then and um, what I have only grown to uh, appreciate more and more is that um, having folks like Lenny being able to go into the home is uh, really what we need to, to close the loop there. One of the things that really struck me, the, the woman you saw in the video with asthma, um, she's very articulate. She's a teacher. She's a retired teacher. She's literate. She's not someone who, you know, she's, she's a savvy person. And, she's, and she, although she talked about being intimidated by the healthcare system, which all of us can identify with no matter what our socioeconomic level is, it's tough. Um, 
you know, she, she struck me as a, as a really sort of like gung-ho person, you know, very outgoing. And yet, and she's 60, in her 60s, and she's had asthma for years, and she didn't know how to use her inhaler right mm -hmm. until Mara Lise was there and, and showed her. And like that boggled my mind. <laughs> you know, like, how can you, how can you have asthma for 40 years and nobody's ever made sure that, and they're not so, you know, if you never had to use one on a kid, they're not, they're not totally, you don't get it the first time. But, you know, sort of how, how, how like, how did you know if someone didn't know how to use their, if she had come into your office, would you have ever thought, after 40 years, have you still not figured out how to use this yeah. button, right? Yeah, well, I, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think that uh, given the pressures for what a clinician has to cover in a short period of time. Yeah, assume that somewhere in those um, 40 years, yeah, they would have figured it out. Right, and you're not, you're not uh, or, or clinicians are not frequently uh, doing an assessment, and it, you need to assess repeatedly. Um, and unfortunately, that patient is like so many others. And you, you'd be shocked. It's almost comical. It would be comical if it weren't so sad when you see you know, somebody who has terrible asthma and you see them use the inhaler, and they use it, and all the medicine's going, blowing out the sides of their mouth. Yeah, I mean, it's um, not They're funny, just right? not getting the medicine. Teresa, you most, at least in the context I met you in, you're mostly working with CHF, congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. um, but you've been an out, you've worked with them in an outpatient setting as well, as so this is the new, in you're working with the hospital. Right. And for those of you who don't know, congestive heart failure, people, are, it's like, when you hear about the revolving door, they're the revolving door. Like, they are in the hospital, out of the hospital, in the hospital. It's, and yet it is, a, a, of the diseases that lead to a lot of readmissions, we do have some knowledge about how to reduce that. But we don't always act on the knowledge. So can you, t I mean, you, you probably have patients who are in it five times in a month. Um, I, I interviewed someone once in, Ohio and Iowa, nothing to do with this program, who never really understood that salt and sodium were the same thing mm -hmm. until a nurse finally came to his house and threw out all the soup. So what are you, um, let's talk about what you're seeing and what, what are the patients experiencing? And, sure. and how are you working it into a big bureaucratic <coughs> hospital that isn't used to working this way? I mean, you've been open, you've been early adopters, but there have to be some issues as well. Right, and, and so just to give a little bit of background, I first started working with Menmead and City Health Works when I worked with Alex in the outpatient primary care clinic. And just like he mentioned, it's, it's a largely urban, underserved patient population where we knew, we know the residents and the um, primary care physicians and clinicians could tell or were often told about the social factors affecting their care. Um, but unfortunately, just like many community health centers and primary care practices, we are not set up to really sit with the patient and go over things and have staff to go out into the community. So we knew, we'd always known it was a hole and this opportunity was amazing. And so that's how I first got to work with City Health Works. We saw the great changes in diabetes outcomes, but unfortunately, um, the utilization metrics, while promising, were not at a, at a you know, impactful enough scale to have hospitals say, yes, we're gonna pay for this right now. Um, and so that's what got me thinking as I moved into the hospital space, um, and my clinical work is actually in home-based primary care. So I, I had seen over the 15 years of being a home-based primary care physician, the kind of informal networks that occurred and really helped keep patients at home in the community cared for by their uh, family and empowering their family through these informal networks and really spending the time in educating them. So fast forward a few years to my work now at Mount Sinai St. Luke's, which is also um, an urban inner city hospital serving largely the Harlem population for more acute illnesses. Um, believing in this model, and again, the strength of this model is in its workforce development and the training and the clinical backup, as well as the uh, workflows that they develop with the clinical teams. It took us about six months to create, if not more, to create this community um, health works and uh, city health work and um, congestive heart failure team really working across both the community and the inpatient setting, um, targeting people who are already in the hospital. So the outcomes we were looking at are things that hospitals paid much more attention to, insurance plans paid much more attention to, that being 30-day readmission avoidance. If p we could keep people, once they're discharged from 
the hospital with a diagnosis of congestive heart failure or CHF and help them, support them at home so that all of the care plans, the new medications or the changes in medications we could couple with really practical um, sort of self-management techniques like knowing how to use the scale, understanding that fluid restriction meant juice and soda and water, not just water, <laughs> um, the kinds of foods you could eat that was, that was congruent with your culture and your preferences, things that physicians want to do or you know, most primary care physicians want to do but can't do and really don't have the understanding of what's in the community, where to walk, where is it safe to walk so you can get your 30 minutes of exercise. That's the kind of stuff that we're working on now with really conscious efforts at looking at how the teams work together with, you know, these health workers and coaches have to be considered part of the care team. Um, and I think that's a challenge that um, we're happily working through and, and really creating workflows so that it, it changes the culture of the doctors and the nurses and the social workers and that they see that this is an added part of the team that really adds value. And it's, it's not doing anyone else's work, it's doing work that can't be done by the hospital. What about the, um, how have you avoided having this be another silo? Mm -hmm. I mean, y the idea is to integrate, but we always sort of manage to make things um, unnecessarily complicated and there are all sorts of, this is, an, if you talk about team-based medicine, this is a new kind of team. This is a new partner on a team. So how are you getting it accepted in the hospital? And, and Sinai is an interesting hospital. I mean, you're in an interesting neighbor. I've, I've done stories there before. You have a lot of innovative people there. You also have some who aren't, as anywhere. I mean, how have you begun to um, change how people think, who is a healthcare provider, who gives value to the care of this patient, and how do you integrate that instead of dump it over there? That's a good question. I, I think the, the short answer is that it's really hard. Um, and I think how you get the success um, of doing something like this is really by A, understanding all the different stakeholders who might be interested in this work, um, people who might think it's something they should be doing, get them in the room, think about what the common goal is, pick your population. Um, we picked congestive heart failure for a very specific reason. Like, like you had said, these patients have, Kabung, Kabung, yeah. they come in and out of the hospital, there are readmissions, penalties associated with it, there are a lot of quality uh, metrics associated with the congestive heart failure population. There was a lot of reason to focus on this group, especially in our community. The CHF team were sort of, you know, beside themselves. They were running around making phone calls and unable to really make an impact on these numbers. So. We brought in um, City Health Works and we said, what can we do together? Um, you explained what your model was on the outpatient side to the team and from there we started talking about what kind of transitions of care programming we could make. Um, they helped build the model, they helped with the training, so our CHF team was actually part of the training of the coaches to understand what the red flags are, what the yellow, green, you know, the red, yellow and green lights were so that we could figure out, and we still continue to do this, it's really iterative, how to call, who to call, when is it an emergency, when is it not? How do we get the patient to make these calls for themselves over time? And when is it time to bring in another team member? Mental health. I mean, the, the idea of having people work with patients with chronic disease, whether it's CHF or asthma, is not a new problem. There are community health workers that are based in hospitals and clinics or community health like, I mean they may not call them that, but people right. who do some of these follow-ups and, and, and coordination. Yep. Your model is different. You have uh, a community-based model that is forming partnerships with a variety of providers. Why is that the best way to go? Or at least for yeah. you now in your organization. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is essential for how we developed it, but going forward, um, you know, as I think even as non-clinician building this didn't feel comfortable going out and meeting with patients about their health without m being on the same page as a care plan. So that was at the, the basic reason was that we didn't want to be giving b even basic education about what diabetes means without knowing what's this individual person's you know, um, uh, guidance from their provider. And then secondly, we knew that for us to be able to be responsive to their needs when they have issues, we needed to be able to get that kind of support. So administratively, it's been a four-year collaboration with 
starting with one clinic, now second clinic, now, you know, um, worked with six sites in Upper Manhattan, mostly with Mount Sinai thus far, and now inpatient and learning together how can we administratively connect this information that our coaches are identifying with the support of the clinical supervisor and then get it acted upon and that's where you know Tracy was referring to some of the hard work we've been doing around figuring out those workflows um, but I, I think that the other reason it's been very important is that we found that health plans have been very interested in us not just because our early data look good but because the providers talk about us a lot in New York uh, I think that the investment we made in co-developing these workflows has really paid off in terms of a lot of the clinicians in Harlem, not just at Harlem Sinai, but other clinics, say, oh, this coach has had a really big effect on my patient. And as you look forward, as you try to grow, are you looking toward um, geographic growth, new neighborhoods, new hospitals and clinics to partner with, mm -hmm. or new services? not necessarily growing to more patients, but providing, as we've been talking about, social determinants, we've been talking about comorbidity, um, extra layers within the world that you're working in now. Yeah, no, I mean, we, <laughs> we took a lot of time to figure out what's the right role and scope of what this coaching uh, layer should provide and not to overstep either, which is as well, you know, as Jamila mentioned, we're making referrals to social services. We're not fully solving those social needs. We're a bridge there as well. Um, we are adding additional condition areas, you know, chronic conditions that the coaches are uh, trained in, but our, our concept of go growth is that it's essential for us to become much larger um, for two reasons. One is that the demand is very high. Patients, have, you know, people in every community in the country are struggling with preventable chronic illnesses, and there's an amazingly simple solution of giving them someone like Maricilis or Lenny to talk to that, to help them be healthier at home longer. Um, so we absolutely see this as something that will grow geographically, but we also see it growing by having more people across the country, more health systems asking themselves, what is our solution to disease management support? How are we designing it in a way that is more um, in tune with the reality of the, 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 the barriers of people who are vulnerable experience? And um, are we going to do it in-house? Are we going to partner with an organization like City Health Works? I think we're already seeing this trend developing, and I know we'll explore that in the next um, session, but I also think that City Health Works from a policy perspective will be more powerful if it has grown geographically because of this idea that so many good ideas, but if it doesn't scale. Um, yeah. Scaling, um, both scaling individual projects as well as spreading what you do to oh, Baltimore or Boston, we are always surprised in healthcare of how hard that is. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it would be really interesting to come back in two or three years and find out how people who've tried to do what you've done mm -hmm. um, I mean, are we only going to be hearing you at every conference, or are there going to be five or six or a hundred other? I mean, that's, that's sort of the big challenge, right? People make something work, and we really aren't very good at making things spread. Yep. So maybe we will the come back. Challenge. I think I need to cut this one off, <laughs> and thank you. And we'll have, and there'll be a little bit of duplication. We will be, and the next panel we will be discussing, and then there'll be some Q&A, both from those of you in the room after the next one, and those of you watching on the, uh, on the live, on the, I guess on the webcast it says how to do that? Okay. Okay, and then um, the Twitter feed is, Twitter hash is live at Urban, right? Okay. So thank all of you.
Ready? Okay. So on this panel, we're going to be talking about the payer and provider perspective. How do we spread these programs, build these programs, and pay for these programs? Um, we have uh, Jacob Ryder, who uh, many of you know from his work before at ONC, but he's now the CEO at Alliance for Better Health. And Melissa Cohen, who's the Vice President for Payment Innovation Strategy at Anthem. And you may also know her work from CMMI, the Innovation Center at Medicare and Medicaid. One of the places that's been, both of them in their prior jobs were generating a lot of these experiments, some of which will work and some of which we will wonder why we ever did. Um, <laughs> um, well put. <laughs> that's, the, that's the idea, right? You're, they were designed to do the many, many, many things some of which won't work, but you need to experiment. So I didn't mean it in a pejorative sense. No, I mean, no. Some of them, some of them, you know, the former head of um, Urban, uh, Bob Reichauer said, you know, who's not the world's most optimistic economist, said there's so many things here, some of them have to stick. So, um, and, and community health, let's talk about is community health work something that's going to stick? It's been around for a few decades in various forms. The, um, there was some work, I think someone told me it originated, I've heard various d versions of how it originated, but some of it was during the HIV crisis, um, peer, peer, peers taking care of peers. Um, some of it was sort of haphazard, some was informality, but we really do, there's an there's a increasing understanding that we have an acute care system built in 1965 and all of us have chronic diseases and that we have to shift, I mean that's sort of the part of the ACA that we may not articulate very well, but we're not actually not fighting about, right? As we are trying to move this to our healthcare system matches what we actually get sick from. Does, does the payer or provider world see community health workers as part of the solution, and how, how is that growing? Melissa, you want to start? Sure. Uh, I think that there is more and more of a focus on the social determinants of health. Um, however, payers are dipping their toes in the water slowly. Uh, there is this transition from the fee-for-service environment to more value-based care arrangements. And I think in the context of value-based care, uh, payers, while not being prescriptive about how to engage health coaches or community health workers, are starting to see when holding providers accountable for the, the cost and the quality outcomes of a given population that uh, this is one of the tools that the provider community is using to get those results. Uh, less so you've seen uh, some payers, and Anthem has done this in the New York Medicaid space, starting to engage community health workers more specifically and paying them directly, but there is uh, somewhat of a tension because one, uh, especially in Medicaid, but across all lines of business, there is significant churn, about 30% year to year of, of the members. And so making these significant investments in population health, which, are, uh, which, which have been shown to lead to improved health in the community, um, sometimes you don't see that return on investment that quickly, especially if a, say, community health worker is given a panel of a thousand patients and doesn't get to see half of them until halfway through the year, and it takes eight or nine months to, to actually see that improved health outcome. Uh, I think those are some of the tensions that, that payers are struggling with when deciding whether to invest specifically in paying this type of provider or to hold the provider community, the physicians, accountable for cost and quality and not be pres prescriptive about the specific interventions to improve that overall health of the population. Jacob, you see the value in this form of care. How do you see it spreading? How do you see it taking root, not just in a few sort of oases of smart people doing creative things? How does it become available to millions of patients who could use it? It's funny because we, we're talking about behavior change. And so when the health coach is interacting with a community member who's trying to change their nutrition behavior, um, we heard about the use of motiva motivational interviewing and understanding where they're starting from. And so your question, I would, I, I, I would think about it the same way. Where are the providers starting? 
What's their behavior change process? Where are the payers? Where have they lived since 1965? Mm -hmm. And what <laughs> if they- Notice this, <laughs> they, they, you have all this data. <laughs> what, what have they become accustomed to, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, raise your hand if you've ever been to a foreign country. For those at home, most. Uh, <laughs> raise your hand if you ever went to a familiar restaurant, say, and I, I won't look, um, McDonald's or Burger King or something like that, <laughs> in the foreign country, right? I, I'll, I'll, you know, we, we didn't look. But a fair number of people go to these familiar places, right? Because we like what we know. It's more comfortable, even if we know it's not good for us, it's not engaging in the new culture that we committed to learn about. And so, so the work that I'm doing, and I know the, the work that City Health Works is doing, um, this is all new. And, and so when we did this in our community, I, I had breakfast with Manmeet this morning and we talked about our, our little experiment. So I started a uh, new CEO of this organization that was gonna fix healthcare in our community. In five minutes, right? Two years. <laughs> we had millions of dollars to do it from New York State as a byproduct of the, of the, uh, of the waiver from, from uh, CMS. So, so, is that the DISRIP, the worst, yes. the worst acronym in healthcare? Yes. Right. Okay. So this is the DISRIP program, Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that one. You know, it takes a former Fed to, to learn all these it's things. It's all about the acronyms. Yeah. As for that one, oh, right. Yeah. So, so we're doing this thing, and, and what I was seeing was that our community was not embracing c real engagement with the community. So the hospitals were not putting people on the street corners. The practices weren't doing it, even though we gave them that autonomy. And I said, well, we're just going to do it. So we just do it, did it. And we found that you need a little infrastructure. Um, you need to train folks so that they know why they're doing it. Um, so that was a long way of not answering your question. <laughs> we need training. We need infrastructure. We need models for how to do this. We need models for how to communicate it and its value so that the payers can become accustomed to the concept, to the providers, if they so choose, can get out of their own way. I think this is another thing we could talk about, right? We physicians have been taught that we're the center of care delivery universe. We need to get over that. How do you, I mean, but that's, I mean, that's what we were talking about before on team, but we, you know, we said a little more politely and team get, they're non-traditional partners in team-based care, right? And they're, to how do you break through? I mean, they were they're not bad. They were trained that way. They were taught that, right? It was mm -hmm. it was behavior taught. How do how do you reteach that behavior? And do you need data? Do you need a charismatic person to come in? Do you need a pay, you know a, a, a fiscal carrot? Is it is it the Medicare penalties? You know the the readmission penalties are getting steeper. What what do you, what is your carrot? all of the above, yeah. isn't it, right? You need the fiscal opportunity. Mm -hmm. You need some motivational interviewing with the providers to say, so what would you like to be when you grow up? So if we all agree that patients who have diabetes should have nutritional counseling, how can we help you achieve that goal? Not, you must refer your patients to the health coach. How, what are the resources that you would like to have available, right? We treat this as if we are having a motivational interviewing conversation with the care providers. Create pull, and this is what we're trying to do in our community, right? Rather than push, we create pull, and then we get drawn in. So the payers are now asking us to engage, to work with community-based organizations, to think about how we address social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. We're not going in there saying, you need to address these things. We're saying, how can we help you address these things? <laughs> At the same time, the state is saying, you must address these things. So there are, there is a, there's a bit of a stick that government's playing a role there, too. We were also talked, we talked about the move from the, the slow move, but it is happening from acute to a more chronic-oriented system. We're also moving slowly from a fee-for-service mm -hmm. to more of a value-based global payment and whatever else not just the, 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 the per episode or per treatment. Um, 
you're not, we're not where either of you want us to be, but there is change. Is, can you do this kind of work in fee-for-service, or do you have to do it in the new models, other than maybe a little bit of the readmissions money? I, I think there's, well, also Medicare Advantage is part of that, too. I think there's, there's space for both models, but really, um, as you were saying, the value-based contracting provides some of the incentives that providers need to want to deliver this type of care. And, and Medicare has been experimenting in this space with things like ACOs, um, accountable health communities that specifically addresses uh, social determinants of health and reaching out to community service organizations and the more recent uh, diabetes prevention program. And, and you see a mix of those things in the models I just talked about. With ACOs, you're not being prescriptive, you're changing the way that you pay for physicians and you're holding them accountable for cost and quality. Uh, but for instance, in the diabetes prevention program, you're creating a new provider um, a supplier type in Medicare and you are specifically paying uh, in a fee-for-service context for a given intervention. So th I think we're still in the stage where we're testing a lot of ways for this to work and it could be a combination of the two, some sort of fee-for-service payments to these types of uh, new types of providers while holding um, providers uh, more globally accountable for the cost of care and the quality of care for a given population, more focus on outcomes metrics and a move away from some of these process measures and claims-based measures to really focusing on um, the outcomes. The, um, there are a number of ways you could set up a community health worker program. It could be within a clinic, it could be within a hospital, it could be the community-based partnering with them. Um, have you worked with all various kinds, and what are some of the pluses and minuses? So in our community, um, we have not worked with various kinds. Um, we've tried, we tried to encourage the care delivery organizations to make these investments themselves. I would say the, the broadest investments that they've made have been in care coordinators. Um, so nurses sitting on phone banks. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, don't we know that doesn't work very well? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How about we know that for, we, it, it works was, better was if I, you have a relationship, right? I, I mean, if it's the same nurse that talks to you every day. Totally. So I, <laughs> I, was, I was trying to be so generous and you just called me out on that. <laughs> like, I thought so we learned we, that like 10 years ago. <laughs> we know this, but remember. But we have to learn it again? Where are they, right? So this is, this is what we've observed, right? So we said, hey, you ought to have more engaged outreach. What are you thinking? And they said, oh, we're going to buy some nurses and put them on phone banks. And we said, OK, that's where you are. That was part of why we just put people on the street to say, no, no, you got to go further upstream. Because the phone bank doesn't have a personal relationship, and it doesn't look in the refrigerator and many other things that uh, uh, over decades we have experienced that the phone banks, but this is what they know, right? So but Don't they know the part about how it does? Yeah. So <laughs> See? This, this is why healthcare, this is why I'll always have a job. This is our reality, <laughs> right? So we watched them do that, and if we oh. wagged our finger, we would just have pissed them off more, right? So we just did something different, and our hypothesis was if we do something different, we model the behavior that we seek to um, motivate uh, that we would cause this to happen more. I, uh, and where are you in that process? It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but how long have you been trying? Ten months. Okay. Yeah. So, so we're how long are you going to give it? Yeah, another couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so we are, and and now we'll stop being as silly as perhaps we were, but we weren't um. actually being silly. Um, so we are now in a conversation with one of our regional payers to uh, basically enter into a value-based payment arrangement wherein we would work with community-based organizations to do what would be done. Um, and we would be the intermediary between the payer and the CBOs. And then we're going to teach the CBOs, and this has been an education for me, you know, That's family CBS doctor. Com community-based organization? Community-based organization. Food pantry, homeless shelter, 
drug uh, sub substance use treatment uh, facility. These are, these are folks who live grant to grant to grant, don't know how to spell outcome. Um, so they don't, they don't know about outcomes. They don't know about quality measures. They don't know about the things that payers speak. So sitting between the two of them and helping to connect the get, those, those gaps is something that we're, we're now investing in. How are you beginning to, I mean, there are some phone banks. I mean, what I've seen or read is that when there's a smaller patient population mm -hmm. and a, like three nurses that deal with them and they know each other, there's a relationship, it works better than these sort of 800 numbers where mm -hmm. you're just getting a disembodied voice. Um, and we're still apparently doing disembodied voices. What, what are the, how are you creating change or encouraging change with the providers that Anthem contracts with or, or the models that you promote into the community? I mean, what's, so, what are you excited about? Uh, so there is now a movement in payment innovation to, to focus more on working with high value providers, not just providing these, and um, what we call at <coughs> Anthem is the, our ACO arrangement is the uh, Enhanced Personal Health Care, it's our EPHC contract. Uh, which we have with our providers and we pay a care coordination fee and everyone's got to come in and a lot of them are an upside only risk and this was our foray into the value-based contracting arena but now there is a movement to really think thoughtfully about who we want to work with and to encourage our members to see these high value providers and be somewhat more prescriptive, but there's that tension there between uh, wanting to see these types of activities, this type of engagement, uh, but not pissing providers off and saying, this is what you need to do to contract with us. So it really is this delicate balance and we're moving away from the kind of here's a care coordination fee and you're at, uh, you know, we're gonna hold you accountable for cost and quality upside only to a more serious, we're going to try to work with the high value providers that know how to deliver outcomes for us and we're gonna give them the opportunity to have more of a share of, of savings and to provide them with uh, certain benefits and to really make the effort to steer members to those providers that we know that can deliver those results that will hopefully encourage them to continue to invest in these types of behaviors. And have you seen, I mean, this is just anecdote and we all know how much that's worth, but anecdotes have value too. Are, you, are, there, pay, are there people you've worked with who are very skeptical about this who are saying, oh, I, I get it now, I, I'm, you know, give me more of this. I mean, how is, how is adoption occurring? Or how is adoption self-fulfilled, like not just occurring, but like getting integrated? And I think, I think it's all across the map. Uh, one of the things that CMS was doing was really driving uh, the, putting the foot on the gas for this move from fee-for-service to value-based contracting. And I think the, uh, the provider community at large is really looking to CMS to find out whether they should still keep that one foot in fee for service because these these it's are profitable. these are huge investments and you don't necessarily see results right away. We actually in our models have seen that the longer that providers are at this, uh, the more that there is this culture change, this behavior change, the more successful they are. But in an environment where people are looking at uh, year to year results and they need to see a shared savings payment to continue to invest in these types of behaviors, uh, it's, it's really difficult for people to continually convince those skeptics, this is worth doing, this is where the winds are going and we're not turning back. And hopefully we've gotten to a point where the, the barge has moved enough <laughs> in a direction that it's that much more difficult to turn back than it is to keep going. But I don't know, I, I, I would like to believe that. I, I would argue it might be a different watercraft. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've, they've still got one foot in both canoes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, 
it's, it's possible that, that um, it's getting more difficult, right? So as, as fee-for-service continues to produce, and we've got fee-for-value, right? They're just like, I don't know, doing more gymnastics, and it's getting really <laughs> scary. But you can get fall in that you're not in either one, right? <laughs> Maybe that's, and Maybe some, some might happen. argue that that might be the right thing. And we've seen experiments in that domain too, right? So folks who are going full risk and just say, hey, you know, and some of the Medicare Advantage activities ha ha have some of that flavor. Um, but then it's just a segment of the population if it's Medicare Advantage. We've been talking about people who have multiple diseases and we've been talking about alternative, fa alternative payment models and value. Let's go back to one disease mm -hmm. and fee-for-service, which is diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, Medicare has recently started paying community health workers to do, for pre-diabetes, early diabetes, to do education to avoid um, becoming sicker or from going from pre-diabetes to full-fledged diabetes. Um, I don't think, I think there have been some kinds of group classes before, but it's a new, it's a new payment model and it's for community health workers. Do we need to do that for people who we didn't catch downstream or upstream and are now severe and need, I mean, just, just this, is this something that we should be doing with community health workers and severe diabetes, just focusing on that? You can get to the, all the other problems, but is there, is there a role just focusing on that? And then what do we have to, if, if the answer is yes, if this is valuable and it'll pay off, how do we convince CMS that this is a good innovation for Medicare fee-for-service? As opposed to all the other unmet needs out there that... So uh, with the Diabetes Prevention Program, one of the advantages that CMS had to rely on was the fact that this was research that was funded by the NIH and then by the CDC and there was 20 years of, of work done to create a standardized curriculum that was evidence-based that showed, that showed results. Uh, then there was a small pilot study through the Healthcare Innovation Awards uh, with 17 sites. And through those efforts, and I, and I hope future efforts won't take 20 years, but through those efforts, CMS was able to stand up the diabetes prevention program and even with that, create this new Medicare uh, supplier type, even with all of that, MedPAC still came out with um, a statement saying they, there were serious program integrity concerns and uh, CMS is really going to need to watch this model closely to find what that right balance is between access for beneficiaries and then the program safeguards that are necessary to implement a program like this, which is brand new for Medicare. And I would say that depending on how this program works and, and what is learned, and I think it will be iterative, whether or not they want to start including virtual providers and that type of thing. but. What Medicare has done here is set up the structure in place that could potentially be applied to other chronic conditions. And potentially folks that already have diabetes, potentially other chronic conditions. So the structure is now being set up, but uh, I think more needs to be seen about how a model like this functions in Medicare. And also there needs to be um, that research and that curriculum that is potentially established outside of Medicare that then Medicare is able to adopt. And is that counter to what we're learning about comorbidity and other social um, and psychosocial needs and social determinants? I mean, there's a role, there may be a role for group education, but is that, do we think that, do we know that works? I mean. It's nothing I've written about a lot, I don't know, but is, is sending somebody to a class, even with the most dynamic, best, you know, city health worker kind of ed diabetes educator, are they going to go to the class and are they going to take it home and change behavior enough to prevent diabetes without all the other things that Mamit's people are bringing in terms of listening, social isolation, making connections, communicating to the primary care, um, 
I mean, I can, I can pass it over to you, but just to say specifically about the diabetes prevention program that was able to be scaled nationally because through this pilot program, where it is a 16-week curriculum, and there is some aspect to group learning, but also personalized attention as well, it was shown to reduce costs to the Medicare program and to improve the quality outcomes for those beneficiaries. So it and do you think it would work for the more severely out of control diabetes? We don't, do we have any data? Why are you both looking at me? I, <laughs> the clinician. I'm, I'm, just a, the data I'm just a family doctor. <laughs> I, I would sidestep the question. Uh, <laughs> see, I, I was in DC for three years. <laughs> the, isn't it, if there's some data that demonstrates that some intervention is somewhat it. Uh, impactful. If you only, even if only you only do well, X percentage of the people you prevent from getting to diabetes. I'm actually going the other way. Okay. So what? Right? So, so yes, it's a, impactful so for some subset of the population, right? It works for the people it works for. It doesn't work for others. I think the, the program that's, that Manmeet and team are putting together by being personalized, right? So, some people talk about population health, and I object to the term because it means eight things to eight different people, right? But you know it um, when you see it. Well, oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I'm married to a lawyer, so I know the matter. <laughs> but see, now I totally lost my really poignant thought. Um, where to go? The diabetes working for some people. Um, so uh, really, I, I totally lost it. Well, and not working for others. Yes, but it's my fault. It, I took your thought. It's okay. Um, we we personalized program. Oh yeah, there you go. You've heard me say this. Personalized proactive health, right? That's what I was going for. So instead of calling it population health, you call it personalized proactive health. And then instead of putting in an algorithm and saying you have to go to this class or you have to do this thing or this is the binder full of guidelines, you say. Let's go out, let's find out what the problem is with this individual, and you can't do that without this kind of workforce. It's not possible. Clinicians like me, we're not trained to do that, right? We're trained, you stepped on a rusty nail, I know what to do. We're not trained to really understand where they are and help them chart their own course toward better health. Audience questions, there's a mic that's going to come around. Thank you. Uh, can you identify yourself? Can you make sure it's actually a question? <laughs> Hi, I'm Polly Pittman from GW. Um, so one thing that we hear from ACOs, pioneer ACOs in particular, is as you all have said, that workforce changes take a long time and the rationale from a financial perspective is just not there for a long time and so they can't justify it with their CFOs. So as a payer, Melissa, <laughs> now, it seems as though there are ways to shortcut this. I mean, you could require of providers that they have serv certain services. You could invest in organizations like um, the one we've been hearing about this morning. Mm -hmm. There are ways that you could make the change happen with, that are not around waiting six months or a year to see if they're cost savings. Mm -hmm. It seems like this cost savings thing is just held out as the panacea when it's not the only mechanism for change, nor is fee-for-service the only mechanism. Yep. So I guess, I guess the question is, uh, would you agree? <laughs> <laughs> yes or no? Qualified question. I, I, I would agree. I think, there are, I think there are ways to partner with organizations, and, and like I was saying earlier, to seek out high-value providers that are interested in these types of partnerships. Um, regarding the financial arrangements, you see this in the Next Generation ACO program, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, and Anthem is looking into this too now, figuring out ways to not be in this hamster wheel where you're continually rebasing and providers are uh, not necessarily seeing that business case to continue along this journey, but to reward providers that are already efficient to define ways to reward providers for improvement as well as already being that market leader because when you look at where savings are realized across these ACOs, um, 
there are some in Florida that did really, really well, and then you have some other uh, ACOs out there that have been doing some of this work for a long time and have become more efficient, have engaged those uh, community resources and um, been involved in personalized, proactive <laughs> care. Health. Health. Yeah. Uh, personalized proactive health uh, and and for them it's it's harder because it's you know you you really need that behavior change and you can't just immediately cut out that low-hanging fruit where you're you know you're just kind of changing site of service or reducing length of stay if there was already a lot of inefficiency in the system over here in the mic second round Hi, my name is Diana. Again, um, I'm from PCORI. So, as I stated before, PCORI has um, over 50 studies that are have community health workers um, to deliver patient-centered care. And as our studies are beginning to come to a close, many of them, we are looking at different ways to slice and dice our portfolio so that it's most meaningful to end users. However, our portfolio is super diverse and it's across conditions. Um, so my question is, what um, recommendations would you provide to a researcher or research funder as far as how we can package our results of our studies to be most meaningful? As that's very similar to some of the questions that came in over emails, like what are you measuring and how are you packaging it? I, I don't mean packaging in a bad way, I mean how are, you, how are you using it to be useful? So what do you need from them? I mean, if they've got data that's sliced and diced, how do you turn that into something that's meaningful, actionable, and someone thinks it's good for their bottom line? Um, I, th I think there are, are two things that would be very helpful. Uh, one of them is in the measurement space. I think that while there's been work on this for years and years, we are, we are still not where we need to be in being able to measure patient outcomes. And we have a lot of process measures, claims-based measures, but uh, kind of uh, ADL measures and outcomes measures, members, uh, member satisfaction measures, we are not where we need to be. So in trying to figure out if a program works or not, uh, and if we're getting the results that we need to see, uh, we're using a lot of proxies for what, what we really want to find out. So research in that space, I think, would be really helpful. Um, and, and the other is just, um, it's, there's so much going on that it is very difficult to disentangle how all of these things work together. So uh, if, and, and, and I find that sometimes an intervention will work well with certain infrastructure already in place and something that works in one market will not necessarily work in another market and it's very, it's very hard to, to decide where to deploy certain things, but it's much easier to deploy the same thing everywhere. So kind of figuring out for certain types of interventions, what are the things that need to be in place for it to be successful? Uh, I'll augment briefly, um, and I agree. I, you know, measures and measurement are, are um, two slices of the same piece of bread, right? Organizations like CMS or Anthem need a measure so that they know what to hold an organization accountable for. At the same time, I think there is a place for proxies. And measurement as a skill needs to be built so that a care delivery organization, and I sort of said tongue in cheek earlier that the community-based organizations, the food pantry, the homeless shelter, can't spell outcome. And of course, what I, just, what I meant by that was they don't have experience with measurement. They don't have experience saying, hey, here are the number of people that we're going to prevent from going to the emergency department. Because that, as an answer to your question, is something Melissa cares about, right? She cares that <laughs> in this population, this many fewer people went to the ED. So it's a very tangible, very clear expectation that if you have studies that could express that, make that shovel ready for me to bring to her. 
and say, gosh, here's an easy place for us to invest. Building that skill for this community is, I think, an important part of this cultural migration. We need to think about how we will measure, not about creating a measure, but the activity of measurement. There's a question here from Steve Zuckerman at Urban, and I owe him a favor, so I'm going to ask it. Um, he wants to know more about how do you identify a high value provider, and I would add to that, what is the relationship between high value and a community health worker? Where, where do the, where's that marriage? So, uh, is, uh, you know it when you see it? No, I'm <laughs> joking. Well, what are the uh, metrics? I mean, but, uh, what have for, you measured? Right? Uh, for, for high value providers, we're really looking at certain quality metrics, which are dependent, by, uh, dependent on line of business, obviously, uh, Medicare and Medicaid would potentially have different metrics. So you would have pediatric metrics for one that you wouldn't have for another. Uh, and then also cost. Cost is very important and it's uh, efficiency, uh, cost to market average as well as, uh, as well as price and utilization. Do you have anything to add to that? I, yeah, I mean, we, you, it's all in the data and you you know, accused me of thinking that way before, and it's true. We can look at the data, either utilization of cer certain services like the emergency department, or you know, how many of my patients as a primary care doctor who present to me with back pain end up with surgery, and how many don't. And mm -hmm. we know from reasonably good clinical literature that back surgery is indicated in some small percentages of those, those patients. I, I, Melissa's seen the, vari the variability in CMS claims, I'm sure. It's all over the map, yep. right? You could see 4% or 44%. And so I would suspect that a high value provider in that context to both of us is somebody who's thoughtful, conservative, um, making the right decisions that are patient focused, right? So does the patient need this? They should get it. The patient doesn't need it. Yeah, even though it's going to help somebody make their Lexus payments, they, sh they shouldn't get it. And where do some of the intangibles, I mean, they're not intangible, but non-traditional measures, right? Um, the, the value that, you know, the, the, the things you saw in that video or that I saw when I visited some of these patients or that you heard them describe, is it, do we know how to bring that in yet? Is that just because, okay, this patient wasn't readmitted, therefore this is high value? Where, where is the, the data that we're hearing about from a group like City Health Works, where does that fit into your contracting and high value and how we think about it? I mean, certain are, of them are, are proxy measures like um, glucose measures, uh, medication adherence measures, and those are things that community health workers are specifically geared towards uh, helping patients with. And, and there is, I think, with community health workers, this tension between um, kind of focusing on, and it sounds like this program focuses on all three, the care navigation, the care coordination, and the health coaching. But uh, I think the, a lot of the, the work that's being done in, with payers where they're saying to themselves, we've already done some of this stuff, is around the care navigation and the care coordination. And where you can really see behavior change for some of these uh, chronic conditions is in that health coaching space. Uh, where you can teach someone how to, in addition to navigating the health system and overcoming some of those barriers to, uh, to health and wellness like transportation or something like that, focusing on specific behaviors like glucose monitoring, medication adherence, um, nutrition, and those types of things. And those uh, hopefully are reflected in some of those outcomes measures that we use to determine um, how well a, a, a physician is able to care for their population. Or, or a community. In New York, we're looking at patient activation measures, right? So the PAM. The PAM scores, right? So a, a, an attempt to capture a patient's engagement 
in working toward achieving greater health. So, so it's an experiment. It's a proxy. Um, another proxy might be wellness visit, right? Did this patient have an encounter with a primary care provider in the last 24 months? That, that one could argue that is a not so bad proxy for engagement in one's health. Now, I'm not sure I've had an engagement with a primary <laughs> care provider in the last 24 months, so maybe I'm not so engaged as you I should be. You haven't been in an ER. I have not. That's true. We, you presumed, but you were right. <laughs> <laughs> Might have said right. right. Um, another question for you. We have like one or two more, so make it quick right back here. We don't have a lot of time, but. Hi, uh, my name is Katie Ralston. I'm with Maryland um, Medicaid. We're specifically working on a demonstration that offers the National Diabetes Prevention Program to Medicaid beneficiaries. And with our talks, we've obviously uh, have been addressing a bunch of social determinants of health uh, among our Medicaid beneficiaries. And they've had a lot of issues accessing the in-person programs, uh, transportation, childcare, et cetera. So we've really been talking a lot about using the social, social determinants of health ICD-10 codes. So I wanted to see if you guys have been using those at all and have CHWs been using them, providers, or what are your, what's your take on that? So we've not, we don't bill for our services, so we've not been using them. Uh, and I, I, I don't think I can uh, intelligently speak to the, um, the social determinants ICD-10 codes, but uh, it's nice to know that there are some. <laughs> <laughs> but this is basically talking about taking the Medicare program we were talking about, and the state of Maryland is also making it available for Medicaid. Or this is the early diabetes, correct? Right. Okay. So That's great. you know, policy response that doesn't answer your question. Uh, I think capturing that data is a good thing. Now, how how well that data is captured by whom we know from you know, other clinical build, billing experience that, you know, billing codes are not a great way of capturing a real flavor for reality. Um, so be careful and probably don't put too many eggs in that basket. Um. <laughs> and I, I would say that also uh, Maryland participates in the, uh, the, the Maryland model as with CMS. So there are, you know, they're being held to, uh, their hospitals are being held to a global budget. There's now uh, a plan to really focus on uh, medical home models within Maryland. So to the extent that uh, providers are at risk for a patient population, it would be poten potentially, you would be able to engage them in providing these services um, in some way. Uh, without using the billing codes. Okay, I think that is time up for this panel, so thank you, Jacob and Melissa. I guess I can just fill in the time briefly. I told Manmeet this morning that I'd been up too late talking to a college friend who I hadn't talked to for a long time. And it turned out that it was sort of a worthwhile thing he was maybe going to contribute to. And totally coincidentally, because I did not know her, it had something to do with what Janice's husband is doing. So <laughs> everyone who thinks you have six degrees of separation, I'm, I'm 0.06. <laughs> So everybody just stretch. Is she in the building? Is she here? OK. Oh, here she is. OK. Secretary Sebelius. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Good. So you all know she was the secretary when we got, HH, uh, got the ACA, um, did the implementation including a lot of the CMMI things that we've been talking about, this sort of era of 
innovation and experimentation. She's now on the, like a, she has a consultant, your, what's the biggest resources, is that what it's called? I have it written down. It's, it's just me. Just you. <laughs> but you're, on the, you're, you're also on Kaiser Family Foundation, you're involved in a whole lot of things, um, and you think about, I mean, I think you, you were state insurance commissioner too, I mean, you, you've gone from, you think you think big picture, and I think you think social determinants. So, um, when did you come across this concept of community health work, and how, how have you seen it develop? And I'm also going to ask some devil's advocate questions, but we won't start with those. Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, it's nice to be here. Um, and I think I first, um, I mean, the community health work concept has sort of been around for a long time, and um, I would say it's, it's sort of returning to roots. Uh, in some ways, it's, the model has been incredibly successful in developing countries. It's work that we were driving in um, through the CDC, which has employees in 50 countries around the world, uh, in places where there were not enough trained healthcare providers, but community workers became a great connection and a great way to reach out. I've also seen it, I mean, 15 years ago, they were running projects in um, poor areas with pregnant women knocking on doors. And, and I know San Antonio did it for a while, others did it for a while. Uh, the goal was to really get um, women to make prenatal visits, to help people carry their babies to term, to have full-term babies. And again, miraculously successful. Um, we're a little slow. I would say in the U.S. health system, um, you know, it's like, well, this can work. We did a lot of community outreach, also, Joanne, in the um, enrollment for affordable care. We found that community workers, surprisingly, uh, were the best possible folks to talk to people about why health insurance mattered. They had cultural competency, language competency. People trusted them. And so if we really wanted people who had never had insurance before to actually sign up, having a community trained health worker assist in that was brilliant. Um, I think I met Manmi, I don't know, three years ago maybe? Two years ago? Um, I was at a meeting in New York and somebody said we have this right young woman who's doing this amazing stuff. Would you be willing to talk to her? And I said, sure. And uh, I've been following the project, uh, been connected with her a bit at the Aspen Institute, and watched this CityWorks project develop. I also know the Mount Sinai people, and it, um, it has been a great success. Is, is, the, um, is the idea something that people now assume has a role, or is it who are Mark. people? I mean, the people you come in touch with, the people who you, if you I mean, give a talk. I mean, there are two universes. I, right, I just right. will say that. Um, Physicians, do they think, do, does, there's no such thing as a typical a physician, but if you say there's this great group in Harlem and they are doing wonderful work with asthma and CHF and, and um, uh, you know, diabetes and readmissions, and you have something to learn from them. And by the way, she got some of her ideas from Africa and India. Are yeah. they going to listen or are they going to say, eh, I don't need that? Well, yeah. I, I, you know, the first question, unfortunately, our payment system drives what we do. And the payment system is always outmoded and outdated. It looks back. It doesn't look forward. So the first question is, interesting idea, how do we do that? Who pays for it? Who? I'll do it as long as you pay for it. Yeah, right. or, you know, that's always a great idea. I think um, for, for a lot of docs, though, they're trying to find ways to maximize their time, to figure out, certainly primary care providers are, gerontologists are, how do I make these visits matter? How do I keep, now that we are finally um, trying to realign at least the government systems to pay for keeping people healthy in the first place, let's start there. There is now finally a beginning of an alignment of a financial incentive to do that. And so I think the physician interest in expanding their opportunity to reach into people's homes, to actually have longer conversations, to have eyes and ears. You know, 
what we know about chronic conditions, 50% of the people don't adhere to their medications. They get prescribed a medication, there's no medication adherence. Well, having someone just that basic, if, if that number gets raised to 75%, that's a big deal. And it is a big deal in terms of people's health, it's a big deal in terms of outcomes. Um, so I think there, there will be a growing interest in, in how you expand that. Do you think we're at a tripping point? Do you think five years from now we will see this has become maybe not a prevalent but a highly visible part of our healthcare system? Well, I don't want to sound overly partisan. Um, I think we're at a tipping point for lots of things. I'm not sure we'll be alive five years from now. Let me just start there. I wake up every morning and um, the least of our problems is whether we're going to have health coaches. I mean, but um, I, I cannot figure out, frankly, what the organizing principle of the Republican Party is around health care. And I mean that very seriously. I, I don't know if they want to save money or have more people with coverage or more choice or what. I mean, I really don't know. So I don't know where they're going. Um, but I do think there is a growing awareness. Payers um, have a growing awareness, certainly in the private sector and, and a lot of the government programs that personal contact matters, um, that we have to change the trajectory. So let me just give you a little 30,000 foot snapshot. Just, just take Medicare, 59 million beneficiaries, roughly, give or take a million or two, depending on the day of the week. 11,000 people a day turning 65. So that number is continuing to grow. It will level off, but it's still a growing number. 30% of those folks have five or more chronic conditions. $675 billion spend in 2016. And the top 10% of that, those patients spend almost 60% of the dollars. Again, huge numbers, a relatively small array of folks. And if you begin to change their health status just a little, uh, not a ton, a little, you have huge cost savings and huge quality of life difference. So the government, I think, as a payer, is very focused on that cohort. And I think we'll look at the data that I know CityWorks is doing a number of tests right now, but looking at the data about what really does work, can you influence behavior, can you make a difference in this trajectory, uh, I think will have a lot of resonating impact. Yeah. If you were secretary of HHS or something like that. If oh, you were, imagine. <laughs> if, you were at, or if you were in a community and you were trying to put community health workers in place, right. and you couldn't put them everywhere, right. or nor would you want to. If you wanted to start, would you be looking at the, the prevention, the, the making people not get sicker, the, the upstream, let's, let's see if we can stop them here and keep them at pre-diabetes and not let them go to diabetes? Would you go more toward really looking for the social determinants where you know so many things in our such high need that it's hard to even focus on health? Or would you go to the person who already has five chronic diseases? You know, they've got CHF and diabetes and whatever else, and they're really high cost, and they're in and out of hospitals. Would you, would you, is that, am I even asking the question right? Is that what you would try to figure out where to put them? Well, I think, again, um, in some ways we have to do all of the above. I, I don't think you can start prevention with a population that has chronic disease. So you have to start prevention at a very different level and probably in grade school and probably with a lot of parents. And here's what we know, smoking, obesity, <clears throat> bingo. Those are the targets, those are the goals. So healthier eating, more exercise, uh, BMIs, teaching parents how to cook, you know, ranges of things, plus, um, Anything we can do to keep kids from smoking, anything, is, is a big payoff because those are the two underlying conditions that drive a lot of the chronic. So prevention can be very focused. And 
Um, I'm not sure you need a lot of one-on-one -on -one health coaches to do that, but you need the education system involved, you need the playground system, you need mayors to take this very seriously, you need employers to understand that, uh, but we're talking about childcare and early childhood and I mean the way kids buckle up their seat belts and told their parents to buckle up their seat belts. We want kids to be eating vegetables and tell their parents to eat vegetables. Still not we want that kids. way in my house. I understand, but <laughs> that, I mean, we've seen it happen. We, we know that kids can change their own behavior and can change other people's behavior if this is a national crisis. So that's one piece. In terms of where the health workers go, I, I think it's, it's important to look at the most, uh, okay, the, the data that I just gave you missed one piece. Only 4% of those Medicare beneficiaries are in nursing homes. Everybody else is at home or in some kind of, only 4%. So we are talking about people who are in some kind of living situation outside of a constant care. I, I think you, you try to intervene in some of the sickest cases to try and keep people from frequent hospital visits, not only because it's very costly, but it is costly on people's health. Going to the hospital never come out makes people sicker. <laughs> yes. It does not, it isn't a good thing. It is, and in all due deference to the best hospitals in the world, it, you it see, doesn't you work. Be you wanna, there, right. So trying to um, intervene before you have to have a hospital visit, I think is really helpful. Drug adherence, and going into folks' houses, is there food? Are they likely to fall? Have they filled a medication? Do they understand what they're taking? I mean, that in and of itself, I think can be extraordinarily helpful. And, you know, be then the eyes and ears of the doctor to communicate that real time back and forth. Um, what about just the fact that somebody, I mean, we, we, we talk about social determinants in terms of housing and transportation, education. We're just beginning to also talk about isolation sure. and depression. Sure, loneliness, and, sure. Right. How much is, like you just say, wow, there's somebody visiting them three days a week? Well, I, I think, you well, know, you talk to anybody from the Meals on Wheels program, the food is a piece of it. Having the visitor come to the house and sit even for 15 minutes um, often is the much more important piece of it. So having a health worker who actually says, how are you doing? What is happening? You know, how can I help? What do you need? What, and, and also, even if the person, the patient, the consumer can't articulate it, use your own judgment. You know, open the refrigerator. If, if there's nothing there, that's a need. The, you know, the or if it's all client may not be, a, right, be able to express that, but it, it is three, f um, I remember people talking about being in bathrooms where there are, you know, fluffy throw rugs, which are lovely, but a absolute disaster waiting to happen. You know, you hit one of those and skid across the floor. So things that people can look at and then also, I, I mean, I'm a big believer that particularly with older clients, particularly with sicker clients, particularly with people who might be depressed about where they are, be lonely, be isolated, the last thing they want to acknowledge is that they, they need to be dependent on somebody. They, losing independence is, is really hard. So communicating with family members or some other trusted person, what else is going on? because I think that also extends the care, you're trying to extend a caregiving circle around somebody to keep them healthier. To create, creation, to, to create yeah. links, not more silos. You bet. So somebody knowing, you know, your mom has a prescription, but it wasn't filled. Um, or she really doesn't understand how to take it. Or picking up the three rugs. And um, I mean, those conversations, I think, because having the patient translate, I have sat with somebody and many of you may have had the same experience. I've sat with a friend, a younger friend, in a, an emergency room waiting for a doctor visit, having three or four people come in and out, asking each time, what medications do you take? And listening to the list change. Because as the person gets more anxious or more tired or more confused, 
you know, you start out with 20, you get down to 10, then there's, uh, you know, it changed each time. And I think, what if that, you know, this is a 50 year old who's had some trauma, but not, what if that person is 80 and they're trying to go through the same thing? So I, th I think there are a whole lot of factors that, but one of the, if we're serious about costs, lowering costs in the healthcare system and increasing quality, we have to diversify the workforce significantly more than we have. We have to actually allow practitioners to practice to the scope of their training. Let's start there, because there are a whole lot of PAs and nurse practitioners who are locked in because of some turf battle with the medical society in states around the country. And there are lots of very able, community-minded folks who would love a little training and be able to have a job and a skill. And expanding this workforce is, is something we gotta do. Here's the, the question that maybe, it's not quite devil's advocate, but it's, you know, we've all seen Are lots of rainbow, never yeah. been the devil. <laughs> I was the oldest daughter, can't do devil. <laughs> Can oh, I do devil pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> you were in politics. <laughs> also oldest right. daughter. The, the, we've seen lots of, you know, <laughs> rainbows and unicorns, right? We've seen a lot of magic things that are gonna yeah. solve healthcare. I think everybody in this room believes in, in social determinants as something we need to address. Five years from now, are we going to think we either overestimated or, more likely, this is maybe the better question, are we expecting too much of the healthcare system to now solve all of these things? Is Mamit yeah. supposed to now make sure someone's taking yeah. their medicine, knows how to use their inhaler, isn't going to the hospital, measuring their fluids, getting food, getting transportation, getting heat, getting educated, you know, getting their kids educated. I mean, where, where are, are, do we understand the conversation we've now embarked on? Well, those expectations are clearly way unrealistic. On the other hand, we still, as a country, spend a pile more money on health care than any other person. And most of health care, I believe, or most of health is determined not by an interaction with the health care system, but by what happens outside the system. Air you breathe, water you drink, where you eat, work, play, how you eat, how you exercise. Um, and until we, as a nation, understand that, and embrace that, and until, frankly, we get employers to say, I am really interested in helping to pay for this, and taxpayers to demand it, and have a health in all policy. So it's not City Works who's responsible for this, it's everybody. It's every city planner who's saying, you know, what do we do with housing projects in neighborhoods and paths and bike paths, what do we do in the school system? What Health has to be everybody's job. Um, and until it is, we're gonna keep repeating all of these mistakes. But I think extending a physician, again, we go back to why I start with some of the sickest cohorts and some of the folks who are on a trajectory to get a lot sicker and maybe can be intervened with. but. <laughs> with an extension of knowledge, with somebody helping a step at a time to understand how this relates to that, um, I think we can make a difference in some of those things. Can you do the heat and the transportation and have a housing unit that works perfectly and make sure that the bus stops on this corner and not three miles down? No, um, that's probably not a realistic expectation. But we have an interesting, so, what we know is seniors particularly want to age in place. Don't want to be in a nursing home, certainly don't want to be in a hospital, don't want to be dependent. We also have a great number of people in the disabled community who need a lot of the same resources. They need supportive housing, they often need home assistance, they need, um, I think there's an opportunity to look at communities supporting folks who can be more fully productive, healthier, staying in place, adding to um, the overall 
value of their lives, but they also then can be taxpayers for longer. They can add to the value of their communities and figure out resources that aren't siloed by, you know, you're 65, so you get this resource, and you're 35, and you need some help getting dressed so you can get to work, so you have this little pocket of money. But look at these as community resources and human resources that we need to, to let everybody live to their full potential. And there's some of that beginning to happen, some of those barriers. We created at HHS, we took the disabled and um, pots of money and silos and, and that whole operation and the Department on Aging and made the Agency for Community Living. And part of it was to drive universal resources to the local level and say, it's the same, you know, it's, it's supported housing, it's transportation that works, it's some kind of assistance. Uh, you may need somebody to make a meal or give you a bath or help you get dressed. Uh, and all of that adds to not only quality of life, but productivity. And I think we need to think more holistically about, about people. We're just about out of time. I want to ask you one quick question with a quick answer because it's a huge problem that we haven't even addressed, which is the opioid crisis. Mm. Have you seen anyone using community health workers to really get in there? And if not, should we be, is that one of the things that we need to be looking at? Maybe. Um, I don't know where you're getting into. Let's start there. Um, there is the concept of peer counseling, but this could um, be. A well, different there kind certainly of are those kinds of efforts underway, and um, you know, I it is it is a a problem that's magnified. I mean, there there certainly are people who are doing great efforts as as sort of community volunteers just feeding folks and creating safe space and making it okay for people to come forward. There also are efforts where, you know, the training of not just first responders, but lots of, Pennsylvania just issued a directive where everyone has a prescription for naloxone. They just said, we're gonna save lives. We start there, nobody should die anymore. And, and so it's become a more universal um, effort. I, the drug courts clearly make a difference. The counseling kind of programs around those drugs make a difference, not locking people up, but actually going through an alternate process. And where community workers, I think, could be extraordinarily helpful is some of those efforts that are saying, here's the alternative to some sort of a prison sense. It's a rehab, which takes a lot of emotional support, a lot of physical support, and matching those people with with peer counselors and helpers, that can be very successful. Doesn't do it with everybody, but it, it makes a big difference. It's sort of an unfair question, a little bit off topic, but it just occurred to me, you no, can't talk about healthcare for three hours without addressing that aspect. So thank you but all for- But Kellyanne Conway has it taken care of. She's my gonna team. fix the opioid. <laughs> that was my story, Art. Yeah. <laughs> Always, most. <laughs>